When referring to tribal in Magic the Gathering, most people refer to decks built around a specific creature type, such as an elf-themed deck being called Elf Tribal. This term actually originates from a card type that was first introduced in the set Future Sight. Tribal, as a supported card type, has since been retired and essentially phased out of the game entirely. While the card type does still exist, it no longer appears as a mechanic in main sets and is mostly remembered for a few notable cards which are printed with the card type. New cards that reference every card type don't even include Tribal anymore, since so much time has passed since they were included in an ascent in any substantial number, that it's less confusing new players to just not include the card type at all. Now, Tribal cards are unique in that by default we'll always have two card types. A Tribal card cannot just be a Tribal and must also be an instant artifact or so on. As for Tribal itself, it essentially gave a non-creature spell a creature type. For example, Favor of the Mighty is a Tribal enchantment and thus has the Giant subtype. Whenever a card lists a creature type in its effects text, such as Blind Spot Giant requiring you to control another giant to attack, it doesn't specifically require another creature. Favor of the Mighty counts as a giant, and thus Blind Spot Giant is able to attack. While many tribal spells specifically mentioned or support their respective creature types, other cards had fairly generic effects and were more tied to their creature type for flavor reasons. Other card games such as Yu-Gi-Oh! or the Dragon Ball Super card game have similar rules in regards to grouping together certain cards. In Yu-Gi-Oh! there are cards that search other cards specifically based on shared archetype name that applies to cards of any type as long as they beat the name requirement. A card such as Goblin Matron is able to search for any goblin spell, which with Tribal could include anything that has the subtype of goblin, such as the burn spell Tarfire. While Magic does still print specific search effects for creature types, these days it tends to be relegated specifically to creatures. Other than that, spells tend to search either a card type or any card at all. Tribal was Magic's first and only for rain to allow cards to be groupable and searched by theming that made into actual print. While Tribal was first printed in Future Sight, it was in Lorien where this set saw most of its high impact cards. One of the most notable at the time of the printing was Bitter Blossom. This tribal enchantment cost one and one black and was a fairy specifically. At each upkeep, it made a fairy rogue token with one power and toughness, as well as the keyword ability flying. This ability made so that the creatures could only be blocked by creatures with flying or reach, which made Bitter Blossom a continual stream of creatures that were hard to block or could be used to chump block much larger creatures. It being a tribal card in specific was quite integral to its success in fairy decks and standard at the time. Spell Stutter Sprite could be cast on your opponent's turn and would counter a spell the mana value equal to or less the number of fairies you controlled. The deck could also protect Bitter Blossom with Scion of Una, preventing it from being targeted by spells or abilities with the Shroud ability. However, it's quite likely that even without Tribal Print on the card, it still would have seen success in those decks. This is especially true since after its standard format, the main home of Bitter Blossom would eventually become modern black-white token decks that had little to no interest into the fairy tribal synergies at all. In the current modern format, such decks are no longer major threats. But to this day, those decks still often use Bitter Blossom as one of their major threats. At face value, it might not seem like there's much issue at all with Tribal as a card type. Beneath the surface, however, it becomes clear that the problems with the mechanic were not balance-oriented. While Bitter Blossom's interaction with other fairies was quite strong, it certainly wasn't too dominant, and the card was playable even in decks that didn't care about the Tribal. The problem arose in the question as to what constitutes as Tribal or not. Bitter Blossom as a card did not do anything special beyond make fairies. Yet a card like Dragon Fodder, which was printed after Lorwyn and created Goblin Tokens, was not a Goblin Tribal card. This distinction felt all the more arbitrary when a card like Tarfire did count as a Goblin Tribal card, despite only being thematically linked to goblins and having no mechanical ties at all. This Tribal instant costs 1 red mana, is a goblin, and deals 2 damage to any target. This was the same rate as an already playable spell like Shock, as generally burn spells were saved for smaller creatures anyway, so 2 damage for 1 mana was fairly worthwhile at the time. Tarfire was, and still is, a playable card. When it was first printed, it saw play both inside dedicated goblin decks, which could reveal it to ensure their auntie's hovel and turn untapped, and inside other decks being as a passable burn spell with some marginal upsides. But, despite the card being perfectly good, the issue came from there being no real distinction in what should or shouldn't be tribal. Many at the time of the tribal's introduction called for cards such as Goblin Grenade to be eroded to be a tribal after the mechanic was introduced. Goblin Grenade is a sorcery that costs a single red mana and requires you to sacrifice a goblin as additional cost to deal 5 damage to any target. Mechanically, it did nothing that Tarfire established was out of character for a goblin spell, since both dealt damage to creatures and players alike. If anything, a goblin grenade arguably made more sense as a goblin tribal card, since its rule text mentioned goblins by name, whereas Tarfire didn't. Even within Lorwyn itself, there was arguments over whether it should or shouldn't have been a tribal. A card like Holfener's Plans depicted a specific tree folk character, yet was not a tree folk tribal card. While not many of these were relevant in terms of determining if a card was meta-relevant or not, it certainly added to the potential concerns over Tribal's implementation and longevity. Although it wasn't quite a major concern yet to Wizards of the Coast, at least not enough to fully stop designing Tribal cards just yet.
Tribullet would appear again one more time as a set mechanic with new cards in the set Rise of Eldrazi. Whereas in Lorwyn, multiple creature types received tribal cards, in this set the card type was reserved for the extra planner invaders, the Eldrazi. There were only four of these tribal Eldrazi cards in the set, each one being a colorless card with a mana value of 7 or higher. Eldrazi Conscription found success in standard with the help of the big mana engine provided by Lotus Cobra. This tribal Eldrazi enchantment cost 8 mana of any color for an aura. The enchanted creature gets plus 10 power and toughness as well as the keyword Trample and Annihilator. Trample ensures that excess combat damage is dealt directly to the defending player, whereas Annihilator's ability that whenever the creature attacks, the defending player must sacrifice two permanents before even declaring blocks. The deck would use Sovereigns of Lost Alara to assist in getting the ore out as fast as possible and turning whichever creature it enchanted into a massive game-ending threat. In modern, a different big mana deck called Tron would later find use for multiple Eldrazi cards and eventually form a variant called Eldrazi Tron. This is where another one of those tribal cards, All Is Dust, would see some success. The tribal sorcery costs 7 mana and forces each player to sacrifice all colored permanents that they control. This often functions as a one-sided board wipe since the Tron player didn't control many, if any, colored permanents, whereas their opponent would often have multiple color permanents unless built around artifacts or the like. While the rise of the Eldrazi tribal cards were functionally fine and cost no power level concerns, it only further strained the question on tribal as a mechanic. No other creature type other than the Eldrazi received any new tribal cards at the time. This was despite there being cards in the Zendarkar blocks, such as Nissa Ravain, that focus on popular creature types that have gotten tribal cards before. Since the other creature types like goblins, elves, and vampires were ignored on the front of tribal cards, it further strained just how relevant of a card type tribal really was in the eyes of players and designers alike. It's important to keep in mind that Lorin was the beginning of most of what we know as a tribal set design. While there were cards in the past that were tribal focused, and a previous set had even focus on creature types, Lorin was the first set with more modern design sensibilities to tackle it. As such, when the theme was touched on again in future sets, it was somewhat difficult to determine when and how the mechanic should come up. If a tribal was too involved, there was the question of how often and how much, if sets should be themed around it, or they should only show up on specific or notable creature types like with the Eldrazi. Eventually, Wizards of the Coast began working on the set Innistrad, which would focus on creature types and their synergies together, much like Lorwyn did. However, it was during designing the Innistrad sets that R&D really began to grapple with the problems that came with tribal. Previous feedback had made it clear that they couldn't just make some cards tribal and others not. Every card that related to a specific creature type in that way should reasonably have the creature type, and cards should reference them accordingly. This left them in rather an interesting position. If Tribal was a card type they were going to continue to support, it would most likely require them to go back and change hundreds of cards to retroactively make them Tribal. They had done something similar before with the Grand Creature Type update, when Lorwyn initially released which retroactively changed the text of over 1,000 cards in an attempt to modernize creature types. While these changes did pave the way for creature types that would later get much greater support like dinosaurs, it also came with a great deal of confusion and general discomfort from the player base. This was primarily because now those 1000 cards no longer functioned as printed, even if the changes were minimal and often positive. The confusion it caused led to more judge calls and general misunderstandings. While wizards could certainly change and update the cards and reprint them with the new proper text, it would not change the cards already printed. Even just adding creature types was enough to confuse some players. Adding in whole new card types and elaborating on effects text would be even more taxing for players, since now there are two versions of the same card, but only one of them is the actual proper one. And that's assuming there's a reprint at all. Some cards from the Grand Creature Type update to this day have not seen printings that have their current rules text. As such, Wizards was even more hesitant to make such a sweeping change. So instead of doing anything so drastic, they instead chose to quietly phase the card type out of regular use entirely. Of course, the design space brought about the introduction of tribal cards is still stronger than ever. Those Innistrad sets that initially marked the end of tribal as a supported mechanic still kept a heavy focus on creature types and playing creatures of the same type together. Instead of a card like Moon Mist being a tribal instant with the werewolf subtype, it's just a normal instant that has an effect that supports werewolves. While it means that little niche upsides that came with being a tribal card no longer would come up, it allowed wizards to freely explore the design space of creature types like this without worrying about clogging up cards with so much extra text that was only relevant some of the time. In fact, one could argue that the biggest point towards why tribal failed was just how infrequently it was relevant in exchange for how much card space it took up. Oftentimes, a card with tribal would be played less because of how good those interactions were, but just because the card itself was pretty good and just so happened to be a tribal. Tribal failed because it took up too much space and did too little of note in return. Notably, tribal didn't disappear entirely for magic, however. When the first Modern Masters reprint set came out, it included multiple tribal cards, especially at lower rarities. This set had creature type synergies at the forefront in its limited environment and incorporated multiple already existing tribal cards into the draft environment. Bound in Silence was a notable inclusion as the set's primary pacifism effect for gumming up powerful creatures. 
However, given that Bounded Silence was a rebel, it meant that the common rebel in the set, Armor Scout, could search Bounded Silence. However, it was the shapeshifter tribal spells that were a particular note for the set's limited environment. Since there were multiple conflicting and competing creature types in the set, shapeshifters tribal spells were essentially the glue to bind those themes together. Much like actual creature shapeshifters, these spells have the keyword changeling, which gives the creature every type all at once. This means any random piece of support for a given creature type can also support that card, allowing for more identical synergies in the draft deck. This especially helped for when multiple people were competing for the same colors and creature types, since sometimes a good creature would be drafted even if that person isn't building that tribe simply because it's a strong card. This allowed for players to have more options even if the cards in the creature type got taken before they were able to draft them. Perhaps the most notable of the changeling spells was Crib Swap. This tribal instant costs 2 generic and 1 white mana and exiles target creature. That creature's controller creates a 1 power 1 toughness shapeshifter creature token with changeling. While it costs more mana than an effect like Path to Exile, it makes up for that in being searchable by any effect that searches a specific creature type. While Commander is a casual format and lacks sanctioned competitive play, decks built around a specific creature type are extremely popular in the format. While of course there are more efficient pieces of removal, Crip Swap and similar cards crop up in these Commander decks because of the extra value they sometimes can offer. Of course this is so slim that even some decks focus on a specific creature type might skew the card altogether. Tribal's most notable impact on the competitive scene doesn't even directly involve any specific card with the type. Tarfire in specific is one that sees the most play in Legacy of Modern, the sanctioned format where Tribal still has a manner of relevance. But it's not because Tarfire itself is strong, especially since Lightning Bolt is legal in both those formats as well. It's simply because Tarfire is a playable Tribal spell. And since Tribal is still a card type, even without it being a supported one, that means it still counts for Tarmogoyf. This creature initially printed in the same set as the first tribal cards costs one generic and one green. Its power is equal to the number of card types amongst cards in all graveyards, and its toughness is equal to that same number but plus one. Tarmogoyf decks have been running some manner of low mana value tribal spells for quite some time. While the card in recent years has fallen out of competitive favor, it has seen a slight resurgence in modern after Modern Horizons 2 introduced five color domain decks in the format built around Scion of Draco. Modern Horizons 2 also included a single card with Tribal as an actual card type, since sets like it are allowed to reference retired mechanics for one-off designs. That card was actually Altar of the Goyf, a Tribal artifact that specifically served as a nod to how much Tarmogoyf and Tribals are intertwined by being an Uhur Goyf Tribal artifact. Tarmogoyf even came out in the same set as the first Tribal card, and mentioned Tribal in its rule text before Lorin even came out. Tribal was a card type born out of desire to expand the design space around creature types. While many of the ideas Tribal introduced are still being iterated on in current set design, and while the card type did in turn have multiple competitively relevant cards, the card type simply proved too problematic to design around in the long term. It was difficult to say what card should or shouldn't be Tribal at all, and to make the mechanic actually cohesive, it would require functionally changing the text of several cards. And all of that would be in service of a mechanic that would only see any real play in dedicated decks, and would otherwise be fairly irrelevant. As such, Tribal is a well-intentioned but short-sighted moment in Magic's design history, which did more for boosting Tarmogoy's relevance in Eternal formats than it did for cohesively tying together creature types. Magic has had a ton of different Tribal strategies over the years, but one of the most interesting has to be the Thalids and the Sap Prolings. This is one of the more experimental approaches to a Tribal mechanic that was eventually abandoned in favor of a more traditional approach to the Sap Proling Tribal. Today, we're going to go over all of the Thalids and the original mechanics and discuss exactly why it didn't work how the mechanic changed over time, and other possible fixes. The Thalid theme first appeared in Fallen Empires all the way back in 1994. The best example of how they work would probably be Thalid itself. This is a 1-1 fungus with a mana cost of 1 green. It is the ability where you put a spore counter on it at the beginning of your upkeep, and you can remove 3 of these spore counters to create a 1-1 green support link creature token. These two abilities are the majority of the Thalids in the set, though some of them do something slightly different. The basic idea of Thalids is that they gain spore counters each turn and can use them for various effects. Though eventually it was settled on just making sapperlings every time. And just for the record, for the rest of the video, I will refer to both of these abilities collectively as the Thalid abilities to save time. Thorn Thalid costs 1 and 2 green for a 2 2 that also gets a spore counter each turn, and you can remove 3 spore counters to deal 1 damage to any target. This is the exception to the rule, as most of the Thalids do, in fact, just make sapperlings. Thalid Devourer is a 2-2 for 3 that has both of Thalid's abilities, but can also sacrifice a Sapper Lane to get plus 1 plus 2 until the end of turn. Elvish Farmer is a 0-2 Elf, rather than a Fungus, with both of Thalid's abilities for 2 mana, but it also lets you sacrifice a Sapper Lane to gain 2 life. And the final Thalid creature is Feral Thalid, which is a 6-3 for 6 that gets a Spore Counter on each of your upkeeps, and you can remove 3 of them to regenerate Feral Thalid, which means that the next time it would be destroyed this turn, you instead tap it, remove all damage from it, and it's removed from combat. 
On top of all these creatures, there was also one piece of non-creature support in the form of Fungal Bloom. This is an enchantment that costs 2 green mana and lets you pay 2 green to put a spore counter on a fungus. So the basic idea of Thalids is that you would have a whole bunch of fungi in your deck who would get spore counters each turn and then you could remove those spore counters to make sapperlings. The issue was that this initial one of creatures was extremely bad, even for the time. The main issue was just that wizards overestimate the payoff of making a 1-1 creature. Making a 1-1 every 3 turns is just not that impactful, especially with so much counterplay being available. It makes sense that this effect would be overestimated, as if you squint, it is a form of card advantage, and a card that can theoretically give you infinite card advantage if you wait it long enough is very tempting as a prospect. On top of all this, Fungal Bloom was a pretty terrible support card. This should go without saying, but paying 2 green for 1 third of a 1 1 Saproling, or 1 third of a regeneration, was an abysmal rate. I really don't know why they didn't make the mana cost here more favorable. Anyway, after Fallen Empires, Wizards essentially learned that the mechanic of waiting 3 turns for 1-1 wasn't as good as they thought it would be. And we can see the lesson being acted upon going forward. After Fallen Empires, we didn't see Thalids for a long time. All the way until Time Spiral Block. This block gave us several more Thalid cards, and one with far, far better abilities and higher power levels overall. First off, basically every Thalid had the standard Thalid abilities now, rather than some doing things like regenerating themselves or pinging as a payoff for removing the spore counters. However, one of the most important changes we can see is how they leaned into the Elvish Farmer direction. Almost every Thalid in the block had the ability to sacrifice a Saproling for some sort of effect. First off, we got a color-shifted version of Elvish Farmer in Mycologist, which is exactly the same as Farmer, but it costs 1-on-1 one -on -one white instead and is a human druid rather than an elf. But there are a ton of new Thalids with Sap Sacrifice abilities. Deathspore Thalid sacks a Sap to give a creature minus 1-1. One, minus one. Pallid Microdurn sacks a Sap to give all of your Saps and Fungi plus 1-1 one, plus one for the turn. Savage Thalid can sack a sap to regenerate target fungus. There were versions of Thalids for basically any effect you could want. You can draw cards off of Psychotrope Thalid, make mana off of Utopia Micon, and give creatures haste with Vitaspore Thalid. However, there were a few new Thalids that didn't have sap killing abilities. There were a few Thalids that focus on improving the spore counter mechanic more directly. Spore Sower Thalid is a 4 4 fungus for 2 and 2 green with the sap making ability, but it gives all your fungus a spore counter on each upkeep rather than just itself. Spore Loft Ancient is a 4 4 fungus for 3 and 2 green with the ability to get spore counters, but it gives all your creatures the ability to make saps by only removing 2 spore counters rather than 3. The last Thalid from Time Spiral is Thelion of Havenwood, which is a very different card from the rest of the Thalids. Rather than a fungus, this is a legendary elf druid with a mana cost of 2 green. It is the abilities where all your fungi get plus one plus one for each spore counter on them. And you can pay one green and one black and exile a fungus from your graveyard to put one spore counter on every fungus on the field. Time Spiral both made the Thalid deck a lot stronger and a lot more interesting. Wizards saw a lot of the issues with the old Thalids and found ways to fix them. Seeing that the old Thalid ability wasn't good enough, they printed Spore Sower and Spore Loth to make the ability better. With both of these cards out, each of your other Thalids will get to make a Saproline every turn. As they'll get their own native spore counter, one from Spore Sower, and since you only need two counters now, this will be enough to make a brand new Saproly. The rest of the Thalots were focused on making those Saprolings more impactful by giving you more things to do with them. Seeing that Elvish Farmer was one of the most dynamic and interesting cards in the first run of the mechanic, Wizards decided to spread its design to more cards, giving the majority of Thalots the ability to sack saps to do something else, making the deck far more dynamic and less linear. Despite all these changes and the overall boost to the power level, it wasn't enough to actually make the deck good. The deck still suffered from being too slow. It couldn't outrun aggro decks, and you still got completely blown out by a board wipe. The fundamental issue here is really the idea of spore counters. The thing is, a lot of the Thalids are versions of very powerful cards. Utopia Micon is basically identical to Skirk Prospector, except it's even better since it lets you get mana of any color. Goblin decks have been very successful, and Skirk is a huge part of letting them get their combos out early. Deathspore Thalid is very similar to Phyrexian Plaguelord, a card that was really good during its run through Standard. By using Plaguelord to sacrifice creatures that were, at that point, pretty much worthless, you could pretty effectively control the board, sniping low toughness creatures or making combat a complete headache for your opponent. Most of the other Thalids have pretty good effects too. The issue is that they just didn't give you enough Saprolings to actually do anything. Waiting 3 turns for a Saproline was just too slow, and the cards that let you get them faster were too expensive to actually fix the issue. We went over this a bit when we talked about Fallen Empires, but let's really get into the meat and potatoes of why the mechanic is so bad. The idea is that your board will slowly build up over time, getting more counters, more Saprolines, and more uses for each of them. The thing is, you have an opponent that's also going to be doing things, 
and they're either going to be trying to kill you or trying to stop you from doing what you want to do. The Thalids didn't have 80 protection, and worst of all, all the value they generated, for the most part, just sat on the board. This means that the deck was very, very weak to removal. Terminating a Thalid with two Spore Counters on it set the deck back a lot, as the cards are costed to not be very good up front due to all the back-end value they can give you. However, the worst thing about them is how vulnerable they are to board wipes. Even if you do manage to generate a bunch of Saprolines and have a board full of Thalids that can use their effects, all that work will be gotten rid of by a single board wipe. This is really bad for the deck, because the deck wants to play a long game. However, the decks that are most likely to let the game go late are control decks who run board wipes. Outside of control, you're going to be running up against aggro decks who deal damage far too quickly for you to generate your Saprolines, and other mid-range decks who usually have a good amount of single target removal that can deal with your enablers. And if you can't get the ball rolling, their more standard threats will more than likely be able to overwhelm you before you can really get going. So in summary, the issue with Thalids is that they didn't really excel in any part of the game. They were too vulnerable to disruption and too slow to outrun any other strategies. Given this, when Wizards decided to bring Thalids and Saprolings back in Dominaria, they went a different direction with the mechanic entirely. This set pushed Thalids into a far more standard tribal direction. Cards like Sporecrow Thalid are simple tribal lords that just about every tribe gets, and your main Saproling producers were now cards like Saproling Migration, which simply gives you two saps or four if it's kicked, Spore Swarm, which gives you three saps for four mana, and creatures like Yavimaya Shepherd and Deathbloom Thalid, neither of which say Spore Counter anywhere on the card. In fact, this entire run of Thalids has no Spore Counters anywhere. They do, however, keep the sacrifice theme alive. Cards like Thalid Omnivore and Thalid Soothsayer are more generic sacrifice outlets, but since your saps were pretty useless anyway, you might as well toss them to these guys for more value. The poster child for this new direction for Thalids and Saprolines is probably Fungal Plots. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green. It is abilities where you pay 1, 1 green and exile a creature card from your graveyard to make a sap, and you can sacrifice 2 saps to draw a card and gain 2 life. This shows a lot of what Thalids were trying to do in these newer incarnations. They were far more focused on the graveyard than before, as well as focusing more on sacrificing creatures than before. This new direction for the deck was more successful than previous iterations, though it didn't break into constructed formats. It was at least a bit better in limited, though the deck didn't get that high rarity support it would need to compete in a standard environment. Now, while this new direction for Thalids does technically allow them to be better, it completely gets rid of their mechanical identity. As we went over earlier, the main mechanical identity for Thalids were the Spore Counters. And now that the cards just don't use them at all, they feel basically completely unrelated to the original mechanic. The time spiral direction for the mechanic may have been bad, but it was interesting, fun, and most of all, different. We haven't seen any mechanic like this before or since, so it might be worth trying to find some way to fix the mechanic without completely abandoning the spore counters. This is obviously a bit of a problem, since the spore counters were what made the mechanic so weak in the first place. This type of mechanic just really has a hard time finding a place in magic. Though, there is now a place where the Thalids could be designed for where they could really shine, Commander. Commander is Magic's premier casual multiplayer format. You could throw all of the Thalids into a Commander deck right now, but they have a couple of issues. First off, they don't really have a great Commander. You could play Thelon of Havenwood, but it's not really a great Commander for the deck. First off, it kind of goes against what you want to do with your Fungi, namely encouraging you not to remove the Spore Counters from them. However, it also only lets you play black and green, meaning you can't play the few white Thalids, which really stinks, since Pallid Microderm is such a great overrun effect for the deck. The Abzan, or white-black-green, options for commanders don't give you many really synergistic options, and because of how parasitic the mechanic is, there's not enough cards to make a real Thalid deck. There are around 17 Thalid cards that synergize the mechanic, and only a few of those are really worth playing. The next issue is that you only get Spore Counters on your upkeep, making them far slower than they would normally be. While there are a few issues, the gameplay loop that Thalids gave you translates to Commander really well. Commander is a slower format more based around more grindy mid-range decks, and the Thalids would slide right in. Sure, there are lots of board wipes, but Commander decks can afford to run more cards to counter this. Thalids could pack cards like Heroic Intervention or comeback cards like Rise from the Dark Realms to protect or get their board back, and at least have a fighting chance. They would probably need a whole pre-con to give them the cards they need, but that would be a very unique deck that nothing else has really done before. It's also worth mentioning that Thalids, despite currently being quite bad, even in Commander, are still rather popular. Lots of the Saprolene cards see play and gave Guru of Spores decks. This is a 0-0 legendary Fungus Shaman, Reed Commander, that costs 2, 1 white, 1 black, and 1 green. 
It enters with 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters, and allows you to pay 1 and remove a plus 1 plus 1 counter from your creature you control to make a sapperling. And you can pay and sacrifice a creature to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature. While Gave does see play in various forms, the Thalids do show up in the deck from time to time, despite not being the strongest cards around. And there are quite a few decks being built around them, despite the fact that, as they work right now, they're rather weak. Some changes would need to be made for the deck to really get legs. I'd probably suggest making it so they get a spore counter each turn. This wouldn't be an issue as cards like Tender Shot Dryad make a sapper lane each upkeep and aren't an issue at all. The Thalids would be pretty fair if they worked with the counters, but were cheaper than Dryad was. So, that's the history of Thalids as a mechanic. They've gone through a few different iterations, eventually selling to the niche of an aristocrat tribal deck so that many other themes have already been done. The spore counters were a very difficult mechanic to balance without either making them too weak or too strong. While finding a place for the mechanic would be fairly difficult, the theme is one of the most unique we've ever seen, and it'd be great to see Wizards revisit the mechanic and give it more legs in a more casual setting. Energy was a mechanic introduced back in the Kaladesh block. This mechanic quickly proved to be exceptionally powerful, though fairly controversial in the community. Most people in the community look back on this mechanic with ire, so today we're going to explore exactly why this design failed. Now, this is technically a failed MTG Mechanics video, but since the mechanic was actually very strong, we decided to change the name to reflect that fact. Onto the mechanic itself, energy was basically an additional resource mechanic. Cards would generate energy, which would simply give you, the player, a number of counters. Then you could later spend this energy for various effects. Most cards that generated energy also used energy, but there were cards that gave you energy without asking for any. Energy was also very, very common in the set with around 70 cards that had energy on them somewhere in their card text. We already mentioned that energy was one of, if not the, best deck at times in its standard format, to the point where it required bans to rein in. The specific deck that ended up being too good was called Teamer Energy. Teamer is the community name for the green-blue-red color combination, named after a clan on the plane of Takir in the same name. Considering how strong the stack was, it only makes sense to go over the prime suspects as to cards that made energy such an infamous mechanic. Aether Hub is a land that gives you energy when it enters a battlefield. You can tap it to add a colorless mana, or you can tap it and pay one energy to add one mana of any color. Aether Hub was just an incredible source of mana fixing for the deck. The mana was so good that the deck was able to splash a fourth color at multiple points in its lifespan to allow it to play some powerful tech options, or simply play some cards that were too good not to splash for. The other card that made the deck so good on mana was Attune with Aether. This is a sorcery with a mana cost of one green. It has the effect where you search your library for a basic land card, put it into your hand, shuffle, and get two energy. A tune allows you to search for your one of basic lands if you didn't draw one of your either hubs, or one of your servants of conduit to filter for mana. This gives you a total of 12 cards that give you mana of any color, which allows you to play a 3 or a 3.5 three color deck without getting punished at all. This was also the only 1 mana spell in the deck, as the deck just didn't have any other good 1 drops to play. A tune would eventually get banned or rain in the deck's power level by hurting its consistency. On top of the great mana fixing, the deck had great threats. Long Tusk Cub was a 2 2 for 1 and 1 green that gives you 2 energy when it deals combat damage to a player, and lets you pay 2 energy to give it a plus 1 plus 1 counter. Cub was a great scaling threat that gave the deck far better early game power. Roller Virtuoso is a 2 3 for 1, 1 blue and 1 red. It gives you 3 energy when it enters a battlefield, and allows you to pay 3 energy to make a 1 1 Thopter artifact creature token with flying. Virtuoso was a great way both to get a lot of energy and to go wide against decks that relied on single target removal, which was made even better by the tokens having flying. It also just let the deck make a ton of chump blockers if they were in a pinch. Bristling Hydra is a 3 2 for 2 into a green that gave you 3 energy when it entered the battlefield, and had the ability where you could pay 3 energy to give it a plus 1 plus 1 counter and have it gain hexproof until the end of turn. Hexproof made it so that your opponent couldn't target it with spells or abilities. Hydra basically required a board wipe to answer, as the deck would always have far too much energy free to run them out of energy and actually resolve a removal spell. The deck also had an amazing removal spell in Harness Lightning, an instant for 1 and 1 red with the effect where you choose a target creature. You gain 3 energy, then you pay any amount of energy and deal that much damage to the chosen creature. Lightning allowed the deck to answer creatures of any size by paying enough energy, which a lot of red decks couldn't do. The other card that got banned from the deck was Rogue Refiner, a 3-2 for 1, 1 green and 1 blue that has the ability to let you draw a card and give you 2 energy when it enters the battlefield. This card was also mostly banned to lower the deck's consistency, as the cycle and extra energy the card gave you allowed you to do what you wanted far more consistently. These cards were the backbone of the Teamer energy deck, but there were tons of other energy cards that were notable. Another card that got banned was Aetherworks Marvel. This was a legendary artifact with the mana cost of 4. It has the abilities where, whenever a permanent was put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you get an energy. 
and then you can pay six energy and tap to look at the top six cards of your library. You can cast a card from among them without paying its mana cost, but you put the rest on the bottom of your library. This card was mostly used to cheat out incredibly powerful cards like Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger and Emrakul the Promised End. This card was actually mostly banned for being uncompetitive rather than being too good. While the deck could fairly consistently spin the Marvel on turn 4, if you didn't spin into a big hit, the deck would often just fold to the powerful aggro decks in that standard or even the Timor energy with more aggressive draw power. However, if they did hit one of their giant tentacle monsters, you would often just lose on the spot. The deck was inconsistent enough that most of the good decks still had a winning matchup against it. But losing random games to a deck where you didn't have much meaningful counterplay was just not fun, so the card was banned. Now that we've gone over all, or at least a majority of the really strong energy cards, Let's talk about the problems with the mechanic. Unlike a lot of the other mechanics we've covered in the series, the mechanic doesn't have any flaws that kill it outright. But rather, it has a lot of design challenges, and it unfortunately fell prey to quite a few of them. The first major issue was how parasitic the mechanic was. Parasitism is the design term wizards use to refer to mechanics that don't work super well with other mechanics. For example, the Outlast mechanic isn't very parasitic. This is a mechanic where you could pay a cost and tap a creature with Outlast to put a plus one plus one counter on the creature, but only as a sorcery. The Outlast mechanic was actually a lot worse at energy, but it wasn't parasitic because it works with a ton of other mechanics in magic. Plus one plus one counters are a very common theme that a lot of other mechanics care about. Energy, on the other hand, is very hard for other mechanics to interact with. There are very few mechanics that interact with players getting counters. The only one that can really interact favorably with it is Proliferate, which works with any mechanic focused on counters, including things like Outlast. Energy doesn't work with things outside of other energy cards, which has you run into a few issues. The main one is that the mechanic never really gets any better. This is why, despite being one of the best standard decks ever with one of the most dominant runs in its format, only being held back by Ramnut Red being a similarly broken deck, the deck has seen no success in any non-rotating format. The mechanic has, in the several years since its printing, not gotten any support, and has only gotten further and further away from being playable in older formats. This is the issue with parasitic mechanics. They only ever get to see play in standard, which makes them a lot less interesting to players. This leads well into the second design challenge, and one that every mechanic faces, game balance. All mechanics need to be both strong enough to be playable, but not too strong as to break a format and with energy, wizards aimed far too high. This is mostly due to the final two design challenges the mechanic faces, the one that makes it hardest to design for. Energy both is impossible to interact with and is extremely versatile. In terms of interacting with energy, you simply can't do anything to stop your opponent from getting energy outside of trying to prevent them from playing their cards at all. The only ways to do this are to counter their spells or make them discard all their cards. This is an issue not only because only two colors get access to these effects, but also because it's just not practical. Once your opponent gets energy, they're going to keep it. There are a couple of cards that were printed in this standard that could prevent energy gains, such as Solemnity, which prevents players, artifacts, creatures, lands, and enchantments from getting counters. Sun Cleanser could also be used to remove all counters from a creature to a player and stop additional counters from being placed there. Both of these cards, unfortunately, weren't enough to stop energy, as they were too clunky and slow on top of coming to a format very late into rotation. Being hard to interact with was an issue, but the versatility is something hard to put into words until you play with the deck. If most of the energy cards are designed around the idea that they were the only energy card in your deck, they'd just be okay. Whirler Virtuoso could be a 2-3 that makes you a 1-1 flyer for just 3 mana, and it would be fair. Long Tusk Cub could be a 2 mana 2-2 two two that gets a plus 1 plus 1 counter when it deals combat damage to an opponent and be fine. What makes them good is being able to use energy from cards like Attune with Aether, other just okay cards, and use the energy on them instead. Long Tusk Cub could be used to push for a ton of damage extremely quickly by dumping all of your energy into it, quickly becoming a 7-7 or bigger. A common play was using Harness Lightning to make 3 energy and not doing any damage with it, just spending it to save for your Bristling Hydra or making another token off of Virtuoso. None of these uses alone are broken, but it allows the pilot to use all the resources in the most effective way possible. This not only made energy very powerful, it made it a deck with a fairly high skill ceiling, and one that was rather fun to play. This is one of the more interesting things about the mechanic. Players will often look back on the deck unfavorably, talk about how hard it is to interact with and how parasitic it was, but despite all these pitfalls, the deck had a kernel of a good idea in it. Being able to stockpile a resource and spend it however you want throughout the entire game is just a fun idea for a mechanic, and if it was balanced correctly, it would probably have been remembered fondly. The problem is, well, besides being a parasitic as we mentioned earlier, is that this versatility makes judging the power level of the mechanic really hard. None of the energy cards are, on their own, broken. It's the entire package that's so good. It's the synergy, quite literally the deck being more than the sum of its parts. 
This is why when Wizards went back after the deck, they banned a Tomb with Aether and Rogue Refiner. None of the individual pieces of the deck were a problem. Each of the deck's threats and spells were mostly fine on their own. It was the ability of the deck to pivot into whatever strategy happened to be best against each opponent that made it so good. Hitting these energy producers made the deck worse at generating tons of energy to spend whatever they needed, while also reducing the consistency of the deck. A tune was mostly hit to restrict the deck's color fixing, as being able to splash whatever colors they needed made the deck far too hard to counter. And Rogue Refiner was a card that just made all the other cards around it far better. You couldn't really interact with it favorably, as the extra energy and card draw was too much to give them by using a removal spell on it. However, it was a big enough body to threaten your opponent's life or their planeswalkers. Banning these two cards really shows how the energy mechanic really just needed an overall power down rather than individual cards being too broken. Now, in many ways, energy is actually an improved version of a previous mechanic. Specifically, charge counters. This is a mechanic that's shown up all over the place throughout Magic's history. And if you look at it, you can kind of see how energy is a new take on this old mechanic. Charge counters are counters that can be placed on a permanent, usually by its own abilities, and don't do anything on their own. They instead are checked for by other abilities to do, well, basically anything. Chalice of the Void checks how many charge counters it has to determine what spells it counters. Magistrate Scepter asks you to remove three charge counters from it to take an extra turn, but costs four mana and tapping it to put a charge counter on it. These two uses are the main way that charge counters are deployed and how they're used currently. However, in Mirrodin Block, Wizards decided to make this less of a one-off design and more of an archetype, and it failed hard. Cards like Core Tapper were designed to give cards more charge counters so you could use their abilities more often, and this didn't really work. The main issue was that your opponent could far too easily remove the cards you were putting all those counters on, leaving all the work you've done go to waste. Combine this with the fact that, to keep these cards balanced, they had to be worse up front, and you have a mechanic that just didn't really work. However, if you think about it, using Core Tapper to charge up your Magistrate Scepter is very similar to using a 2 with Aether to charge up your Long Tusk Cup. Energy is basically just charge counters, but with all the charge counters on you instead of your permanents. This simultaneously creates and solves a big problem. It does make the cards a lot better against removal. However, it also removes basically all ways for your opponent to interact with your game plan. What we need is a middle ground, where interactions don't completely blow you out, but your opponent can still do something about all the counters you're building up. Now, there are a few ways you could try to fix energy mechanic at a design level. First is actually just printing way more of it. This may sound strange, but energy as a mechanic was meant to be a specific deck archetype instead of a fundamental resource that every deck was going to use. If you did design it as a mechanic that every deck would be used in different ways, then the mechanic wouldn't be as problematic. In fact, there were a few decks that weren't as good as Teamer energy, but were still based around it. Dynavolt Tower control decks popped up here and there during that standard. Tower is an artifact that costs 3 mana and has the ability to wear. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you get 2 energy. And you can tap in and pay 5 energy to deal 3 damage to any target. These decks played almost none of the same cards as Teamer Energy. Using Tower and Glimmer of Genius to produce basically all their energy, and using Tower to zap down threats and eventually win the game. If you were to print more cards like this that give you energy for doing specific things with an appropriate payoff, you'd have energy being a more interesting mechanic to build around. Rather than just playing all the best cards that say you gain energy like people did, you'd have people building around specific cards while leaning on some of the same staples as they do now. However, this has a different issue, which is, of course, that this requires printing a ton of more energy cards. It would fundamentally change the game, and that's not something to do lightly. This would also mean that the issue of being unable to interact with the mechanic would be more entrenched into the game, so you'd have to print more cards to deal with that alongside these cards. The other way to fix the mechanic would be building a way to interact with the energy counters more easily into the mechanic. One suggestion has been making it so that, whenever you deal damage to your opponent, you can instead make them lose that much energy instead of losing the life. This would give basically every deck a way to answer the energy decks that were stockpiling up outside of playing very specific answers. However, this would probably require the entire mechanic to be rebalanced, so we'd have to wait for the next time Wizards rolled a mechanic like this out. All in all, energy gets a bit of a bad rap. The mechanic had slightly more legs than a lot of players give it credit for, and the failure of the mechanic was mostly just a failure to balance it properly. The mechanic was interesting to play with, as it gave you a lot of freedom, but this freedom was ultimately what made the deck too strong, alongside the fact that there wasn't any practical way for your opponent to interact with energy counters. If wizards ever want to revisit the mechanic, they may be able to get to work, but it's going to take some work. Affinity is a very infamous mechanic, famous for almost killing the game back when it was introduced all the way back in the original Mirrodin block. However, despite the issues with the mechanic, it's still around today continue to get new cards printed to this day as well. Affinity is, for several reasons, a very powerful and fun mechanic that has had a very rocky history. So today, we're going to be going over the mechanic, talk about how it failed, why it failed, and how Wizards eventually fixed it. Affinity is a very simple mechanic. 
Affinity is always attached to another category of card, such as Affinity for Artifacts or Affinity for Tokens. How the mechanic works is that any card with affinity will cost one less to cast for each permanent you control that matches what they have affinity for. So if you have seven artifacts in the battlefield, a mirror enforcer in your hand, you'll be able to cast enforcer for free, as its cost will be reduced all the way from seven mana down to zero. This is a pretty simple mechanic to understand, and equally easy to understand how to build around the mechanic. You want to put as many cards of specific type in the battlefield as quickly as you can, and this is precisely how the cards were played. Before we can understand how Affinity ended up breaking the entire game, we need to go over the Affinity cards themselves, so we can understand Wizard's thought process in designing them. Frogmite is a 2-2 frog artifact creature with the mana cost of 4. It has Affinity for artifacts and no other abilities. Mirror Enforcer is a 4-4 mirror with the mana cost of 7, Affinity for artifacts and no other abilities. The last Affinity creature to break the game was Somber Hoverguard, a 3-2 drone with the mana cost of 5 and 1 blue. It has flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by creatures with flying or reach, and has Affinity for artifacts. The last affinity card in the original deck was Toughcast, a sorcery that costs 4 and 1 blue with affinity for artifacts and the effect where you draw 2 cards. There are a few big commonalities between all of these cards, mainly that they all have affinity for artifacts specifically, as opposed to other forms of affinity. There were many other forms of affinity in the set, such as the cycle of card that had affinity for certain land types, such as Razor Golem, which had affinity for planes. The only affinity cards from the set that ended up being so broken were the affinity for artifact cards. To see why this is, we need to go over the rates on all these cards. If we take a look at Frogmite and Mirror Enforcer, Frogmite is a 2-2 for 4 mana. The average rate for a 2-2 is 2 mana, and getting it for any less is good. So, to make the card worth playing, you have to have about 3 artifacts in play. And if you hit 4 artifacts, you can cast the spell for free, which is amazing. For Mirror Enforcer, the average rate for a 4-4 is 4 mana. And as a 7 mana spell, you'll need 3 artifacts in the field to make the spell okay, and 4 to make it good. When it comes to cards like Somber Hoverguard, the card is above rate for 2 mana and at a rate for 3 mana, meaning you'll also need about 3 artifacts to make it okay and more to make it very good. And Tough Cast compares directly to Divination, so it only needs 2 artifacts in the field to be on rate. Once it gets to 2 or less mana, the card is very powerful. Looking at all these cards, we can see the design philosophy is fairly simple. You take an effect and make it cost a little bit more than it normally would and allow players to get it for a small discount if they have enough cards on board. If we do a bit of math, we can imagine how this would play out. Let's say you have a Frogmite in your hand. On turn 1, you play a land and then cast an artifact, making Frogmite cost 3 mana. On turn 2, you play another artifact, making Frogmite now cost 2 mana, and be completely on rate. Then on turn 3, you get to do it for a discount by playing another artifact. This means it's about on rate for when you'll be playing it, assuming you play one card it has affinity for a turn. If you play two of them, you can get a larger discount, but this can also be stopped by your opponent removing your artifacts. Of course, this applies to basically all the affinity spells, each of them being on raid, assuming you play one artifact each turn, and being able to get better or worse depending on how many extra or fewer you played. This alone is a pretty good idea for a mechanic, as it gives you a big payoff, but has a reasonable downside to compensate. However, affinity for artifacts was tuned almost entirely incorrectly, and a big reason for that were some of the other cards Wizards printed into Mirrodin. The first major factor that led to affinity for artifacts being broken were the artifact lands. There are a total of six artifact lands that were introduced in the block, one for each of the five colors of mana, and one colorless artifact land in Darksteel Citadel. This means that you can play almost entirely artifact lands in your deck if you want to, which means you'll be playing way more artifacts and getting your affinity for artifacts out a lot faster. Additionally, there are a lot of zero mana artifacts, and a lot of very powerful ones as well. For a quick example, in Mirrodin Block, Wizards printed Chrome Mox and Welding Jar, both zero mana artifacts that affinity decks play. Welding Jar is the weaker of the two, being a zero mana artifact that you can sacrifice to regenerate target artifact. Regeneration is a pretty old keyword, but how it works is that the next time the artifact would be destroyed, you instead tap it, remove all damage from it, which is relevant if it's an artifact creature, and remove it from combat. This allows you to play an additional artifact for no mana that could also save another one of your cards if your opponent ever tried to remove them. Chromox was the most broken card. This is a zero mana artifact with three abilities where, when it enters the battlefield, you exile a non-artifact non-land card from your hand, and they can be tapped to add one mana of any of the exiled card's colors. This card is very powerful all on its own, as getting extra mana is a great effect for any deck. But it's even more effective in affinity decks, as it both reduces the cost of all your affinity spells, as well as adding an actual mana once a turn. The combinations of these two types of cards, artifact lands and zero mana artifacts, completely broke affinity for artifacts. If we were to go back and analyze the rates of the affinity cards with this in mind, the problem immediately becomes obvious. 
If you have a Frogmite in your hand, you can easily have a turn one that looks like Seed of Zanad into Chromox into a one mana artifact creature, and then you can cast Frogmite for one mana. At that point, you can cast any other Frogmite that might be in your hand for free, as you now have four artifacts in play. Even if you don't open extremely well, if you simply play two artifact lands in a row and play an artifact on each of your first two turns, you'll hit four artifacts on turn two, also allowing you to cast your Frogmites for free. The existence of the artifact lands means that your affinity for artifact count would quickly and consistently rise every turn, and you could very easily get your affinity count to twice the expected amount without really even doing anything special. The fact that you could also do far more if you happen to draw some of your zero mana artifacts as well just made the deck even more explosive. This led to a massive issue with the standard metagame after the release of Mirrodin Block. However, before Affinity was addressed, Wizards had to address an even bigger mistake in Skull Clamp, a card that was just individually way too strong and also very good in Affinity. There were a few different decks that were running around beforehand that were competing with Affinity, but once no one could do broken things with Clamp anymore, Affinity immediately took over the format. There wasn't really any competition, and you were either playing Affinity or playing a full deck of cards specifically designed to beat Affinity. This was so bad that players started quitting the game in mass. Players had lost basically all faith in the game's designers to design balanced and fun formats. It had gotten so bad that the game's future was legitimately being threatened. Obviously, Wizards had to do something about this. In March of 2005, Wizards banned 8 cards from Affinity. All 6 artifact lands named Ancient Den, Seed of the Synod, Vault of Whispers, Great Furnace, Tree of Tales, and Darkstill Citadel. Additionally, 2 other cards in the deck, Arcbound Ravager and Disciple of the Vault, were also banned. Both of these cards were also very strong in their own right. Arcbound Ravager is a 0-0 beast artifact creature with a mana cost of 2. It has Modular 1, meaning it enters the battlefield with plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, and when it dies, you can put all these plus 1 plus 1 counters on this creature onto a target artifact creature, and it lets you sacrifice an artifact creature to put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Ravager. Ravager was maybe the most individually powerful card of the deck, as it allows you to turn all of your artifacts directly into damage. It also made the deck very hard to block. If you were attacking with a Ravager and had a few other creatures, the Affinity player could sacrifice all their board to the Ravager and then sacrifice the Ravager itself, moving all the plus one plus one counters onto whatever you didn't block, usually getting in for lethal damage. Making this strategy even better was Disciple of the Vault, a 1-1 human cleric with a mana cost of 1 black. It is the ability where, whenever an artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, you can have target opponent lose 1 life. This means that when you were sacrificing all of your artifacts to Ravager, you'd be pinging your opponent for damage each time. This resulted in a lightning fast aggro deck that was nearly impossible to stop once it got going. Interestingly, rather than ban any of the actual affinity cards, Wizards decided to ban all of their enablers. Banning the artifact lands moved this strategy from completely overwhelming to only very good, and hitting the other best cards in the deck brought it down to just being okay. However, without the artifact lands, the affinity cards themselves stopped seeing as much play. If we take a look into the future of Magic's card design, we can see this actually being a bit of a trend with Affinity decks. Years after Runeheed Standard, Wizards introduced the modern format, where all of the most broken strategies from previous years, and some new ones, would be allowed to see play together, but still keeping out some of the most egregious design mistakes of the earliest sets of the game. Affinity was a deck in this format for years, and is still playable to this day. However, the strategy ended up slowly moving away from playing actual Affinity cards over time. In modern, all the artifact lands, except Darksteel Citadel, were banned, so getting too many artifacts in play at once was just a bit more difficult than it was back at standard. So the deck slowly leaned into other artifact aggro synergies as opposed to playing actual affinity cards, eventually trimming the final few copies of Tough Cast and playing no more affinity cards. However, this all changed with the release of Modern Horizons 2. This set released several pieces of support for the affinity strategy, which at this point was actually fairly weak in the modern format after some of their best cards had been banned. The set did let the deck have a big comeback, however. First off, it printed new, slightly nerfed artifact lands in the bridge cycle. These were artifact lands that entered the battlefield tapped, but could tap for two colorless mana and had indestructible. Additionally, they printed several new affinities for artifact cards, such as Souljorn's Companion, which was basically just a better version of Mirror Enforcer, and more importantly, Thought Monitor. This is a 2-2 construct artifact creature token with the mana cost of 6 and 1 blue. It has flying and affinity for artifacts, and the ability where when it enters the battlefield, you draw 2 cards. This is basically just a thought cast with a 2-2 flyer stapled onto it, which is amazing. The combination of these extra affinity cards and the introduction of new artifact lands led to versions of affinity that actually played affinity for artifact cards you can play in the format once again. Now that we've gone over both how the deck initially broke the game and how it was once again reintroduced into the modern format, we can see the things that made affinity for artifacts in particular so broken. For one, the existence of artifact lands make the mechanic a lot better, 
Other forms of affinity were never really as problematic, simply because they didn't get to increase their affinity count for free while also being able to manually add to it. Cards that had affinity for other lands weren't anywhere near as problematic, because you could always know the rate at which the affinity would start to kick in. Other affinity cards were bounced around the idea that you could play one-ish cards that adds to affinity a turn. Affinity for artifacts was far more powerful because it was artifacts, the card type that had the easiest to fill the board with by far. Additionally, they made another big mistake with a lot of the original affinity for artifact cards, namely that they didn't have any colored mana in their cost. More recently, we've had cards that essentially have affinity for artifacts, such as Emery, Lurker of the Lock, which have been printed and have been fine even if they were very powerful. The ability to cast those spells without paying any mana whatsoever can allow you to have the kind of explosive turns that Affinity is known for far more often. So, the two big rules for Affinity are to not put it into cards that only cost generic mana, and to make sure you don't put it onto something that's too easy to swarm the board with. However, not every card with Affinity for artifacts ended up being broken, as sometimes mechanic just isn't enough to salvage a card. There were plenty of cards with the Affinity mechanic of Mirrodin that didn't end up doing too much. Blink Moth and Fusion is an instant with a mana cost of 12 and 2 blue with Affinity for Artifacts, and the effect where you untap all artifacts. And this is one of the most expensive spells in the entire game, and is overall quite bad. Untapping all artifacts is a potentially powerful effect, but the number of artifacts you would need for Infusion to be cheap enough that it's worth casting is far too many. There were also cards like Broodstar, a beast with a mana cost of 8 and 2 blue. It has Affinity of Artifacts, Flying, and the ability where its power and toughness are each equal to the number of artifacts you control. This card could be okay, but it was just a bit too expensive to consistently make work. It was also mostly irrelevant because Wizards, for some reason, printed Cranial Plating, which boosts a creature's power based on the number of artifacts you control. If you just want to hit someone for big clunks of damage, Plating was just far more practical. This further cements how the exact ways in which Affinity can be broken as these cards having colored mana in their cost is a huge downside. One of the reasons why Frogmite and Mirror Enforcer saw so much play, despite not being flashy, was just because they could be cast for free. It also shows that there's a particular breakdown for Affinity cards that pushes them over the edge, where you can start casting them for far less than you're supposed to. Any Affinity card that costs over 8 mana has ended up being too clunky, as even if your entire hand is cards that add to your Affinity count and you play all of them, you still couldn't cast them. This makes playing those affinity cards very risky. Cards like Mycosynth Golem, a card with a nice body and a very powerful ability, cost 11 mana, and was therefore just a bit too clunky for the average aggro deck, which is what most affinity decks tried to be. This runs into another issue with the design of affinity cards, which is that Wizards hasn't found a way to balance it to make it work in non-aggro decks quite yet. Fairly recently, Wizards decided to bring Affinity back in a much bigger way, with several more cards receiving the mechanic all following those broad rules, though not too many in the grand scheme of things. For a quick example, there were cards like Nahir, Forge, and Fury. This is a 5-4 legendary core artificer with a mana cost of 4, 1 red, and 1 white. It has Affinity for equipment and the ability where, whenever any equipment creature you control attacks, you can exile the top card of your library. Until the end of turn, you can play that card and you can cast equipment cards exile this way without paying their mana cost. Nahiri is quite the fair card, though its affinity ability is quite limited. Equipment as a card type don't really do that much by themselves. They require creatures to be put on, so you can't just fill your deck with equipment. It is worth mentioning just a bit before Nahiri was released, they released a new mechanic called For Mirrodin. This is a mechanic where, whenever the equipment enters the battlefield, you make a 2-2 Red Rebel creature token and attach the equipment to it. This made Nahiri a lot more practical, as you could play a lot more equipment in your deck when they sort of functioned as creatures. Still, this didn't lead to any decks built around the card, as the payoff just wasn't good enough to justify building an entire deck around. There were quite a few cards in the Phyrexia All Will Be One that had affinity for equipment, though not enough to really build a deck around. We did also see the return of affinity for artifacts in the card to plated Onslaught. This is an instant with the mana cost of 3 and 2 white. It has affinity for artifacts and gives your entire board plus 2 plus 1 for the rest of the turn. This is a take on Inspired Charge, a card that costs 1 less to cast and has the same effect. Onslaught compares to charge mostly favorably, though this kind of effect has almost never been good enough to see playing competitive decks, as it's very situational. There are also a number of other cards that essentially had affinity without saying the name for quite some time, though they've all been purposefully limited to use. Angelic Overseer has affinity for citizens, checking for one very specific type of creature, and Gate Colossus essentially has affinity for gates. This mostly goes to show how Wizards has been extremely careful with affinity in recent years printing it very sparsely and with lots of restrictions. They sort of swerved into the opposite problem, which is making the mechanic just a bit too weak to see plain constructed. That's not to say the cards were completely unplayable, you would run into Gate Colossus pretty frequently on the ladder, but they weren't quite competitively viable. 
This is something that requires time to make work, as finding the exact power level for a mechanic can be quite tricky. Interestingly, Wizards has had a lot of success with cards that don't quite have affinity, but have very similar abilities. Cards like Bedlam Reveler and Talarian Terror can both reduce their costs based on the number of instant and sorcery cards in your graveyard, which is typically just the number of instants and sorceries you've played that game. These cards have seen tons of play, but never been too good in any format. It's possible that Wizards, having designed so many cards with cost reducing abilities baked into their own costs, led to them feel more comfortable designing affinity cards, which is why they can print cards like Nahiri, who has affinity and a powerful ability, and know that they won't accidentally break a format. Affinity is a mechanic with a very rocky history, to say the least. Responsible for one of the greatest threats to the game to come around will get you a very bad reputation. Throughout the history of Magic, Wizards has rolled out and decommissioned various forms of protection for their creatures. From regeneration to protection ability itself, Wizards has always been experimenting with ways to stop the opponent from interacting with threats. One of the most interesting histories is the evolution of Shroud into Hexproof and eventually into Ward. Today, we're going to go over what all these abilities do, why Wizards change to each of them, and why they change their mind again, and why these kinds of abilities are so important in the first place. Starting off, let's go over these abilities and how they work. Shroud makes it so that no player can target the permanent with spells or abilities of any kind. On the other hand, Hexproof makes it so that your opponent can't target the permanent with spells or abilities, but you could, unlike with Shroud. Finally, Ward makes it so that whenever the permanent becomes a target of any spell or ability an opponent controls, you counter that spell unless your opponent pays the ward cost. Now, it is worth mentioning that you can technically give these abilities things other than permanents, but only with a few specific effects. Cards like Leyline of Sanctity and Ivory Mask give you the player Hexproof or Shroud, protecting you from things like discard or burn spells. This doesn't come up nearly as much as using these abilities to protect your permanents though. Still, these abilities can basically apply to any game object that can be targeted. There aren't any cards that give this target protection to spells on the stack, but basically every other type of permanent or game object has a card that gives it one of these abilities. Shroud was first introduced in this at Legends with the card Spectral Cloak, which gave enchanted creature Shroud, though the ability wasn't a keyword at the time. Hexproof was introduced in Magic in 2012, at which point it effectively replaced Shroud. Though the ability had appeared before that point, despite not being a keyword yet, similar to Shroud itself. In Portal Three Kingdoms, a simplified version of Magic, the cards Taoist Hermit and Zhu Xi, the Mocking Sage, both had the Hexproof ability far earlier in the game's history, though neither of these cards had much of an impact on the game overall. Finally, Ward was introduced in Strixhaven School of Mages. While this is when the ability as it exists today first came into existence, there were several cards with this kind of ability in the past. Diffusion Sliver had a version of this exact effect all the way back in M15. There have been quite a few cards like Icefall Regent that made spells that target them cost more to cast, which is very similar even if it does have a few notable differences. It's worth mentioning that this didn't fully replace Hexproof, as the designers do still occasionally use Hexproof. This is most common on instants that give a creature Hexproof for a single turn, as these cards can be used in response to removal to save a creature. Now that we've gone over what these abilities do, we need to talk about why they exist. After all, these targeting protection abilities may seem a bit strange from a game design perspective, as they aren't particularly fun. No one likes getting beat to death with a huge hexproof creature that they can't interact with, and it's not particularly fun for the player playing the hexproof threat either. Unlike other abilities where it feels like you have a tangible advantage you can actively use, such as haste, hexproof only stops your opponent from doing anything. It's not really a fun feeling. So, why is the ability not only being printed, but something they've been printing throughout the history of the entire game? The reason is that these kinds of abilities fulfill a critical role in the game. To understand that role, we need to zoom in a bit more on the interaction between permanence and removal. If we were to take a card like Lightning Bolt and a card like Grizzly Bears, there are a few things we can notice. The most important is that Bolt can deal more damage to your opponent in one turn than Grizzly Bears can in one turn. However, since Grizzly Bear sticks around and can attack several times, it can deal 2, and then 4, and then 6 damage, and so on and so forth. This leads to the very obvious realization that instants and sorceries have to have a bigger impact on the game the turn you cast them in order to be worth playing versus permanent spells. Basically, most permanents are an investment. You cast them on one turn with the assumption that you'll be able to use them for several turns after you get more value, whereas instants and sorceries will only ever do what they did when you cast them. The reason this is relevant becomes more clear when we examine what happens when a player uses removal on a threat. In the case of the two cards already mentioned, when you cast Lightning Bolt on Grizzly Bear, both players lose one card. However, the player who cast Bolt only had to spend one mana, whereas the player who cast the Bear lost two. If you remove a threat the turn someone plays it, or the turn immediately after, the opponent will have gotten basically nothing and be down on tempo. It's hard to express only in words how bad this is because tempo is a concept that you have to see in action to really understand. Being up tempo in this case 
by having spent less mana to answer a threat than your opponent has spent on it, allows you to just do more on your turns than your opponent did. This only gets worse when we apply this to more expensive threats. For example, let's say your opponent tapped out for a card like Ancient Brontodon, and your opponent immediately Doomblades it. They're up a total of 6 mana in that exchange. That means they cast 6 mana worth of spells, whereas you basically can't do anything. This sort of tempo blowout makes it basically impossible to play high mana value threats with cheap interaction available in the format. Of course, it's worth mentioning that none of this takes place in a vacuum. Cards like Ancient Brontodon can have a huge impact on the game if allowed to stick around. It takes several other creatures to match its size and power, so removal is pretty necessary to not lose on the spot. Still, the loss in tempo makes playing these kinds of cards very risky without them being incredibly powerful. This is why cards like Lyra Dawnbringer have sort of gone out of favor over time. Lyra is an incredible body for her cost, having three powerful keywords on a 5-5 for 5 mana. Despite this, these kinds of cards will only see play in standard and very particular circumstances, typically when they have good matchups in the metagame. If there are tons of decks with cards like Go for the Throat and them running around, these kinds of expensive, swingy threats that can basically win the game if you untap with them see far less, or possibly no play at all. The reason for all of this preamble is to let us get with it Wizard's frame of mind for designing more expensive threats. Any card that hits 5 mana, and in some formats even 4 mana or higher spells, have a big tempo issue. And Wizards has set out to solve this issue. For a lot of cards, Wizards has come up with two solutions giving the cards ways of generating value right away, or just making them better to compensate for the risk of a blowout. The most common way of making threats impactful on the turn they're played is with enter the battlefield effects. In a way, this is like stapling an instant or sorcery onto a creature, getting the upside of both card types or the downside, usually of costing a lot more mana than it would for either half on their own. A great example of this is a card like Siege Rhino. This is a 4-5 Rhino for 4 mana. It has Trample, letting it deal excess combat damage to defending player or Planeswalker while attacking. And when it hits the field, you gain 3 life and each opponent loses 3 life. Rhino was one of the most important cards back in its standard. And the reason for that, well, is complicated. However, for our purposes, the relevant point is that it was a threat your opponent had to deal with that had a very powerful effect as soon as it was played. Neither the draining 3 life or the 4-5 with trample alone were good enough for 4 mana. But the body is big enough that your opponent has to do something about it. However, even if they do kill Rhino right after it hits the field, you still get the ability off. It sort of hedges its own bets. If it stays around, it's amazing. If it gets killed, it's only okay. As you got to drain 3 life and force your opponent to use a removal spell that was going to be used on something eventually. This means that you can be a lot more comfortable playing this kind of card. You'll see these sorts of ETB effects on all kinds of threats, especially on those higher up the curve. From that same format, Dragonlord Artaka was a 7 mana 8 8 with Flying and Trample that dealt 5 damage however you wanted to your opponent's board with its ETB. Being a removal spell on a giant body meant that even if your opponent killed it right away, you probably got a 2 for 1 and you probably wouldn't just die literally on your opponent's next turn. There are a few other avenues Wizards have tried to make more expensive permanents worth playing. For example, cards like Realm Cloaked Giant. They've tried to make the cards more flexible by giving them more modes to use. However, most good expensive creatures will have some sort of ETB effect put on them nowadays, simply because they need to be that powerful to see play. Now that we've gone over all of the theories surrounding creature design, we can return to protection effects. You see, it's very limited in terms of design space if every creature you print over 5 mana needs an enter the battlefield ability in order to not be made obsolete thanks to Doomblade's effects. You could just design all removal effects be worse to compensate for this, but that would make small creatures too powerful overall. Protection effects give wizards more design space for high mana cost threats. Good example of this would be cards like Dragonlord Ojutai and Carnage Tyrant. Both creatures saw a good amount of play in their standard. Neither of these cards did anything when you played them, but you didn't have to worry about your opponents doom blaming them as soon as they came down because that wasn't possible. You could answer them with more specific answers such as edicts, but this protection was still very relevant. This is the reason why protection effects came into existence so early into Magic's design history. From the very first sets, the problem existed with higher cost threats, so solutions needed to be invented. This led to Shroud, Wizard's first answer to the problem. This mostly worked, but it has a big issue. Players weren't playing it right. There were lots of reasons why you'd want to target your own cards with your own effects, especially with auras and equipments being in the game. Players were trying to throw these cards onto their Shroud creatures, which makes a lot of sense, because if you're going to spend mana on cards, putting something onto a creature, putting them all into the creature that's least likely to die is the best course of action. Of course, this was entirely illegal. Shroud says the creature can't be targeted by any spells or abilities, not just your opponents. Wizards tried to get players to play the keyword correctly for years, but eventually they gave up, 
and decided to come up with a new keyword that worked the way people wanted it to work. In comes Hexproof. This was basically just how people thought Shroud works. This meant that players were playing the cards correctly now, but it created a brand new issue and it started with a certain boggle. This was just a 1-1 with Hexproof for either a blue or green mana. While the cart alone didn't do much of anything, it was easily abused by just throwing a ton of ores onto the cart. This ended up being a huge problem because it was both very strong and really frustrating to deal with. There just wasn't that much an opponent could do against the deck unless they had very specific answers, such as the aforementioned edict effects. The boggle would just get too big too quickly, and the ways to deal with the creature with auras, single target removal, had been disallowed from working. This has led a lot of players to very heavily disliking Hexproof, as it having basically no downside at all while having such a huge impact on the types of counterplay available was just too strong. In fact, the pure strength of these abilities ended up being a huge problem in terms of design, mostly because it stopped them from fulfilling their intended design purpose. The entire point of Hexproof, and by extension Shroud, is that they helped large creatures by being more viable by making them more playable into removal. The issue is that they just went too far. Cards with Hexproof were so good, that had to be basically all they could do. For a good example, look at cards like Carnage Tyrant and Aberritum Elemental, which are both big creatures with Hexproof that don't do too much else. The issue is that, without being able to interact with them, the only way to answer them is to throw a ton of creatures under the bus by blocking them. The main purpose of these large threats with Hexproof is to give players a way to beat control decks, who load up on single target removal spells. This is the way that Carnage Titan was and is still used, and control decks usually have answers to these kinds of threats anyway thanks to all of their board wipes. This is why cards like Dragon Lord Ojitai only have Hexproof under certain conditions, namely that it's untapped. This is designed to protect Ojutai after the turn it's played so that your opponent can't remove it before you untap. That way, if you have any counter magic, you can use it to protect your Ojutai. On the other hand, if you put Hexproof on creatures that are too small, players will just go for the Boggle strategy. This leaves Hexproof and Shroud in a weird place, where they're just too good at their job to really be used in a way where they were initially designed to be used. So what we needed instead was some sort of middle ground. And that middle ground was Ward. This fulfilled basically all of the design goals of Hexproof without running into any of the pitfalls it faced. On small creatures, Ward made its removal slightly worse, but didn't completely invalidate it. Having a card like Savilin of Sea and Sky makes your opponent's removal spells overall a little bit worse, but not completely useless. You could load up with auras and equipment, but your opponent could just pay the Ward cost to remove the threat, even if it was a higher cost overall. On the other hand, putting it on more expensive creatures allows wizards to make more expensive cards that don't do something as soon as they come in and let them have a chance to actually have an impact on the game. For example, cards like Tolarian Terror, which does have an ability to reduce its costs, can pretty confidently be played for 4 or 5 mana without much fear. The ward cost of 2 mana means that if your opponent does remove it at the point in the game, it will usually take up the entirety of their turn, meaning it's very unlikely you'll get entirely blown out. Another big upside of Ward over these other forms of protection is that it has a lot more design space. For example, each color has their own kind of Ward. White, blue, and green mostly get Ward costs that cost mana. However, black and red both have some more unique Ward costs. Red hasn't gotten too many Ward costs so far, but most of its Ward costs are life instead of mana. Black gets two types of Wards. They get the Life Pain Ward that red gets, but they also get discard-based Ward abilities wards that force your opponent to discard cards. These ward costs are interesting, not just because they're within their color identity, but because they change the dynamic around ward quite a bit. The discard costs make it so that if your opponent wants to kill your threat, they have to go minus one, which is good in some ways and bad in others. For one, it doesn't help much with the tempo issue, at least not directly. Your opponent isn't down any mana when they kill your warded creature. However, this can still often make it so that your opponent can't do anything besides remove your threat for their turn, because in the late game, when you'll be casting these kinds of threats, both players will usually be low on cards. Since the ward costs are just that, costs, if they don't have a card to pitch to the ability, they just can't cast a removal spell without it getting countered. So, while it won't always stop your opponent from removing your creatures, in some cases, it will. On the other side, forcing your opponent to pay life can get you a very different kind of tempo. This type of ability has seen play before in cards like Thunderbeak Regent and Leyline of Combustion, which dealt damage to the opponent whenever they targeted one of your creatures with a spell. These cards were very powerful in aggressive decks, where the bit of damage your opponent would take would matter a lot more. If your opponent is at low life, the damage they take from the ward abilities or their predecessors can really matter. Plenty of games were ended by players willingly letting the damage from a Thunderbeak's trigger to not give their opponent satisfaction of killing them in combat. This gives wizards a lot of power to design interesting and powerful ward abilities that can make more expensive threats possible to deal with, but not too weak as so they can't see any play. 
One of the most interesting ward costs is on Sauron, the Dark Lord from the Lord of the Rings crossover set. This is a 6 mana creature with the ward cost of sacrificing a legendary artifact or legendary creature. Against a lot of decks, this is as good as having hexproof, but it does give your opponent an out to Sauron if they're willing to pay the price. Sauron, the Dark Lord, also doesn't have any abilities that trigger when it enters the battlefield, or anything of the sort, so it is a card that you want to untap with to get value out of. It does have an ability that triggers whenever your opponent casts a spell, but the upside is fairly minimal. So, your opponent can often ignore it in most formats and try to push for lethal. Overall, this mostly just goes to show how effective Ward can be in its role. There are other protection abilities that don't prevent targeting, though Wizards has been a bit hesitant to lean on them, as they're better used more sparingly. One of the big ones is Indestructible. This ability prevents damage or destroy effects from destroying the permanent, which has a much bigger impact on the game. While it does make it immune to burn and black's removal, it also makes the creature it's on immune to all combat damage. This has such a huge impact on games that printing indestructible on anything but the absolute most expensive creatures simply wasn't possible. There was also the protection ability itself. Protection stops whatever it's on from being damaged by, targeted by, blocked by, or enchanted or equipped by anything of the listed attribute. This has a couple of the issues that the other protection effects have had. For one, it does apply to both players, as did Shroud, which leads to players just playing the effect wrong a lot. Lots of people just forgot how the effects works and try to cast MA Dead on their Arkham Angel of Wrath before sighing and shaking their head after both cards go to the graveyard. The other issue is that, like with Indestructible, it has too much of an impact on the board for an ability that's trying to stop your opponent from removing your threats as easily. The final ability that used to be used in this role that has since been abandoned is Regenerate. What Regeneration does is make it so that, the next time a creature would die this turn, you instead tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. The main reason Regeneration was removed was because it didn't work the way it was supposed to, at least in terms of flavor. Regeneration was supposed to be a creature that died, coming back, but this wasn't how it actually worked. It was instead a sort of a shield, protecting the creature from the next time it would be destroyed that turn. This has mostly been replaced by just giving a creature indestructible and tapping it for the turn. And this is mostly because Regeneration and Indestructible have the same outs, as they both can be eaten by an exile, removal, bounce, or edicts. In order to make things easier to process, they just remove the keyword and combine the two separate mechanics into one. The result is that we have a lot of old removal spells that say that the creature can't be regenerated, despite that not really being a thing anymore. So, that's the history of Shroud, Hexproof, and Ward. This is something that you can see in a lot of magic designs where they change over the three decades of the game's history. The game has adjusted a lot to the challenges of these kinds of protection abilities. Ward is the end state of this kind of design for the most part, and it still has a ton of space to explore. In the future, we might even see more protection mechanics it introduce, but only time will tell. Werewolves are one of the five tribes that are supported in Innistrad and in each of the returns to that plane. Unlike the other four tribes on that plane, werewolves have had a lot of trouble trying to see play, with very few of their cards ever putting up results, and werewolf decks have never really been successful, despite the other tribes in those sets, such as human, spirits, and zombies, all having had some success at some point. The big difference between werewolves and these other tribes is that all the werewolves, at least on Innistrad, share a very specific mechanic. All werewolves were dual-faced cards that could transform from human form into a werewolf form, and they all shared the same transformation condition. The front side would transform to the werewolf at the beginning of each upkeep if no spells were cast last turn, and the back side would transform back into a human at the beginning of each upkeep if two or more spells were cast last turn. Now, there are tons of transform cards that have seen tons of success. For example, Delver of Secrets or Thing in the Ice. So, the transform mechanic itself isn't the issue. The problem is the condition they choose for werewolves in particular. You see, most transform cards, including werewolves, follow the design philosophy of the front side not being strong enough, but the back side being really, really good. For example, the front side of Delver and Thing are both pretty bad, but the back sides are extremely above rate. The same is largely true for werewolf cards. This has three big issues. First off, this condition is really bad for aggro decks. This condition is really easy for your opponent to interact with, and you have to flip every single werewolf individually. Let's start with why this condition is bad for aggro decks. Aggro decks usually want to flood the board as quickly as possible. This, of course, means they have to cast lots of spells. Of course, if you're casting lots of spells, that means you're never flipping your werewolves over. The only real way to flip this card over an aggro deck is to play them extremely early and just hope your opponent doesn't have anything to cast for one or two mana, which can happen in some hands. Or wait until the late game when your opponent is top decking and hope they top deck a land, but aggro decks usually want the game to end before then. The fact that your opponent might miscast it in early spell made cheap werewolves like Village Messenger and Reckless Waif a lot more likely to transform than other werewolves, which made them much better, but they only saw some play. 
So, this condition made the cards a lot harder to actually swarm the board with, but it also gave your opponent way too much control over what side your cards were on. You see, since you needed a turn where no spells were cast for your cards to flip, your opponent could simply cast a spell on their own turn to stop your board from getting a lot scarier. This means if you wanted your cards to flip, you often had to do it yourself. However, this sets you up for some huge blowouts. What your opponent could do is simply wait for you to go to your end step, and if you cast no spells to try and flip your werewolves, they could cast one tiny, one mana spell to stop all your werewolves from flipping. This was backbreaking, as you basically would have to skip your entire turn and got nothing out of it. And finally, you had to flip every single one of your werewolves individually. Each werewolf checks itself during each upkeep. So if you transform one werewolf and then played another, you'd only have one of them transformed, and you'd either have to wait another turn to not cast any spells in order to flip it, or wait for your opponent to not cast any spells on their turn to flip your next werewolf. This made the mechanic really awkward to play with, as it's a quest that you'd constantly have to be working towards, and constantly trying to figure out if it's better to develop your board or try to flip your cards. Together, this means that the only way to get the good half of your werewolf cards was either to just hope your opponent didn't cast anything, which was fairly unlikely, or to make an incredibly risky play to try and flip your cards and risk your opponent blowing you out. On top of that, you constantly have to think about all of this and have to keep making this difficult decision every single turn. Now, Wizards knew about a lot of these issues, so they did give Werewolf decks a few cards to try and get around all of this. One thing they did was give the deck Flash Spells, like Halpak Resurgence. Flash means you can cast your spells at instant speed. With this, you could still develop your board while skipping your turn to flip all your werewolves. They also gave them some cards like Gaia Reach Bandit, which, when transformed, has the ability to transform any other werewolf you play when it enters the battlefield. This solves the every card flip separately issue, because once you flip Bandit, you've basically flipped all your werewolves. However, there are still a few issues here. You see, you can still only cast one spell each turn, or your stuff will get flipped back to its weak side. This hampers the speed at which you can develop your board. Not to mention, you can only play this way whenever you actually have your Bandit flipped, making it so that a single removal spell can disrupt your strategy. On the other hand, the flash spells like Resurgence were just a little bit too expensive and weak to make up for their instant speed as that's on its own powerful ability. Other tribal decks that came out of the same set could put out just as much damage for far less work, while giving your opponents less ways to stop their game plan. Now, while werewolves as a whole were pretty weak, there were a few standout cards in the bunch that managed to see play. Mayor of Averbrook is a kind of a weird card, because it's actually a human support card and a werewolf support card at the same time. On the front side, it's a 2 mana 1-1 one, one that gives all your other humans plus 1 plus 1, making it an okay way for human decks to try to pump all their creatures. However, once it transforms into Halpak Alpha, it gains the ability to give all your other werewolf and werewolf creatures plus one plus one, and gains the ability where at the beginning of your end step, you create a 2-2 green wolf creature token. This made the card a lot better, as the front side was good in human decks, but if your opponent ever let it flip, it would start to run away with the game by slowly making you a board full of 3-3s. Three this led to the card scene play in a few different formats in human tribal decks. Speaking of werewolves with a really good front half, we have Duskwatch Recruiter. This is a 2 mana 2-2 two, two with the ability where you can pay 2 and 1 green to look at the top 3 cards of your library, reveal a creature card from among them, and put that card into your hand. Then you put the other cards on the bottom of your deck. However, if a player casts no spells, it becomes Crawlin Horde Howler, a 3-3 with the ability where creature spells you cast cost 1 less to cast. The reason that Duskwatch has escaped the werewolf curse is that the front side was actually a lot better than the back side. You see, there were a lot of decks that liked its ability to draw creatures. Certain combo decks can actually make infinite mana, specifically by using Vizier of Remedies and Devoted Druid. Basically, what you would do is tap the Druid for mana, then use its ability to put a minus one minus one counter on itself to untap it. Since Vizier of Remedies will reduce the number of minus one minus one counters placed onto it, you'll actually put zero minus one minus one counters on it instead. This will let you use the ability as many times as you want. Then you'll cast a Walking Ballista, which costs XX, meaning any amount of mana twice enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, and you can remove a plus one plus one counter on it to deal one damage to any target. Since you have infinite mana, you can just kill your opponent. Now, since all three parts of this combo are creatures, Duskwatch can find all of them for you. And once you have the mana to get the combo up, Duskwatch can find Ballista to let you win the game. Since Duskwatch's front half is so strong, the fact that you don't have access to the back half doesn't matter. The last really good werewolf card is Huntmaster of Fells. This is a 2-2 for 2, 1 red, and 1 green that makes you a 2-2 green wolf token and gains you 2 life whenever it enters the battlefield or transforms into Huntmaster. Ravager of the Fails has the ability where, whenever it transforms into the Ravager, you deal 2 damage to target opponent or planeswalker and 2 damage to target creature that the player or that planeswalker's owner controls. Huntmaster is one of the most well-known werewolf cards and solves the problem with werewolves in a really neat way. 
Unlike other werewolves, whenever the card transforms to either side, you get value. Generally, you only want your werewolves on the backside, as that's the strong one. However, Hunt's Master will give you something whenever it transforms at all, making it a lot easier to get value off of. If more werewolves were like this, where transforming at all was beneficial, rather than wanting the card to stay on the backside, the mechanic would be a lot better overall. Now, we've gone over the original iteration of this mechanic, but Wizards recently rebooted the entire mechanic. They introduced the Daybound slash Nightbound mechanic, which was staple to all the werewolves. How this works is that whenever a Daybound card enters the battlefield, it starts the Day-Night cycle. While it's Day, all Daybound cards are on their front face. And while it's Night, they all transform to the backside. How this cycle works is at the beginning of each upkeep, if the players who turn it was last turn didn't cast any spells and it was Day, it becomes night. And if it was night and the turn player cast two or more spells, it becomes day again. This new mechanic solves two big issues with the old mechanic. First off, it only cares about the turn player casting spells. This means your opponent can't opt on your end step to stop you from flipping your cards. So if you want to skip casting spells on your turn to transform your werewolves, your opponent can't stop you. Which makes these cards much, much better. Additionally, now the thing that determines what face your werewolves are on isn't tied to a single card, but rather just part of the game state overall. Once you start the day slash night cycle, the game tracks it regardless as if there's any daybound cards on the field. This means that even if you lose all your werewolves, if it's night and you cast another one, it will still be night and they will transform. This means that the deck basically gets to play as if they had transformed Bandit and play the entire game. This solves two of the three major issues with the werewolf deck, but the final issue still remains. The fact is, skipping your turn to flip your werewolves is still a huge downside, and it's a big enough downside that dedicated werewolves decks still aren't successful. However, this recent version of werewolves has led to a few more individual werewolf cards being successful, and the changes made to the mechanics certainly did help them out. Brutal Kather is a 2-2 for 2 and 1 white with the ability where, when it enters the battlefield or transforms into the Kather, you exile target creatures and opponent control until it leaves the battlefield. On the night side, it's Moon Rage Brute, a 3-3 with first strike, meaning it deals combat damage before other creatures, and Ward pay 3 life, meaning that whenever it becomes a target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you counter it unless they pay 3 life. This card follows the same philosophy as Huntmaster, where it transforming at all is usually good for you. On the front side, it gets an exile card, but on the back side, it's a better creature that requires your opponent to hurt themselves to kill it and get their cards back. Now, you never want this card to enter on its back half, which is why this card has only ever seen play in decks where it's the only werewolf. Another big standout is Graveyard Trespasser. This is a 3-3 for 2 and 1 black, with Ward, discard a card, and the effect where, whenever it attacks, you exile up to one target card from a graveyard, then if it was a creature card, you gain one life and your opponent loses one life. On the back side, it's Graveyard Glutton. A 4-4 with Ward, discard a card, and the ability where when it enters a battlefield or attacks, you exile two cards from Graveyard, then draw one life for each creature you exiled. Trespasser is a card that's good on both sides, and the back side is just a slightly better version of the front side. Without the back side, some decks would maybe still run the card, so having difficulty getting access to it isn't enough to stop it from being good. Now, while the day slash night mechanic did solve some of the deck's problems, it did make a few new ones, at least from a design perspective. You see, these new werewolves don't really play nice with the old ones, because the old ones still work the way they used to and don't care at all if it's day or night. You can see how hard this is designed for by looking at Tovalar, Dire Overlord. This card has the ability on the front side where, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have three or more wolves and or werewolves, it simply becomes night, and then you also transform any number of human werewolf creatures you control. This card is designed to basically stitch the old and new werewolves together, forcing both of them to be on the same side, as well as giving you an easier condition to make it night. Even with this card, werewolves haven't really taken off anywhere. Though, that might not have anything to do with Tovalar not being good enough, and more to do with the deck not having enough good werewolves to play. However, Tovalar has led to the deck being more successful than ever before, at least in standard. Now, there really isn't any other mechanic like werewolves. Most transform cards only transform into the back half, rather than going back and forth. However, there was a deck that did something at least a little bit similar. There was a theme in standard of paying you off for not casting spells during your own turn. There was a deck built around Night Pack Ambusher, which was supposed to be a werewolf support card, but instead saw play in green-blue decks that wanted to play at instant speed. Night Pack Ambusher is a 4-4 wolf with a mana cost of 2 and 2 green, has flash, and has the abilities where other wolf and werewolf creatures you control get plus 1 plus 1, and at the beginning of your end step, if you didn't cast any spells on your turn, you make a 2-2 green wolf creature token. This deck was a lot better than werewolf decks ever were, and the main reason is that skipping their turn to get the wolf token didn't actually mean they were skipping their turn at all, and you could easily lose all your value by your opponent casting two spells on their own turn. You see, 
This deck was built to play on their opponent's turn, playing almost no cards that weren't able to be cast at instant speed. Werewolf decks couldn't do this, because even if they had a few cards with flash, the majority of their cards still had to be played on their own turn. Additionally, the tokens it made for you didn't just die if your opponent cast two spells. In Werewolf decks, as soon as your opponent manages to cast two spells, you're losing all that advantage you got from flipping your cards. This means that the payoff you got for playing on your opponent's turn was way higher. So, we can sort of see why werewolves failed. They had a bunch of restrictions that forced you to try and play on your opponent's turn, which is something that they weren't able to do very well, because too many of their creatures were just normal spells without flash. On top of that, it's a mechanic with a built-in way for your opponent to get around it, because they have as much control over your cards as you do. However, there are a few solutions and a few interesting things about the mechanic. If the cards are designed such that, rather than having a good and bad, like most transform cards, both sides just allowed you to get some form of value, and you just wanted to transform them as much as possible, the mechanic could be made a lot better. Additionally, if the tribe had actually just had flash stapled onto all of their cards, it would be a lot easier to play in your opponent's turn, like other successful decks with a similar theme have done. However, most interesting of all is the fact that werewolf cards seem to work best in other random decks rather than altogether. You see, in things like value-based mid-range decks, you can often hold up mana for interaction or try to grind the game to a standstill, both of which increases the chances of your werewolves flipping. If your opponent is low on cards, they're more likely to not cast a spell on their turn. If you have interaction to play, not casting a spell on your turn becomes a better play far more often. On the other hand, the best werewolves in arrow decks have been one werewolves, where you would play them on turn one and hope your opponent happened to not have a one mana spell to play. Then you would just only cast one spell a turn to get more damage out. Werewolves were often okay, but the mechanic they chose made the deck on a whole very bad. If they didn't transform back into their small human side, or were designed so that transforming in general was always good, the deck might have been more successful. But as for right now, they're a deck that wants to flood the board, but need you to not cast spells to get the full value off of your cards. The cards are pulling you in two different directions, and that results in a very bad deck, with just a few cards with the mechanic managing to see play. The Kamigawa block is notorious for being home to some of Magic's most underperforming and failed mechanics. Perhaps none are as limiting or ineffective as Epic, a keyword ability found in Champions of Kamigawa that essentially removes most, if not all, the player's agency in their own game. Each color got exactly one card with the Epic keyword, and the mechanic was such a failure with such little design space that the mechanic was never revisited directly. Epic is as simple as it is restrictive. When a player resolves a spell with Epic, they are no longer able to cast spells for the rest of the game. In exchange for this massive drawback, the player gets to copy the spell with Epic on their upkeep, except for the Epic ability, and chooses new targets for the copy if they wish. Essentially, once you cast an Epic spell, you are only allowed to use that spell for the rest of the game once you're in each of your upkeep steps. It doesn't matter what cards you draw, regardless of if it's another Epic spell, or even the same Epic spell as the one you cast. Enduring Ideal has a mana value of 7 and searches an enchantment from your library and puts it onto the battlefield. Eternal Dominion costs 10 mana and searches a library for a permanent and lets you put it into the battlefield under your control. Neverending Torment costs 6 mana and lets you search and exile cards from your opponent's library up to the number of cards in your hand. Undying Flames exile cards from the top of your library until you hit a non-land and then deals damage equal to that card's mana value while having a mana value of 6 itself. And for 8 mana, Endless Swarm makes a 1-1 snake creature token for each card in your hand. And once you've cast one of these, it'll be the last spell you cast as it copies itself again on each upkeep. That's not to say you're completely locked from playing the game, however. While you can't cast spells, Epic needs you to be able to put copies of spells on the stack to reuse the Epic spell. And as such, other effects that specifically make copies of spells work while under Epic, although this is a somewhat narrow application. More generally, you can still play lands, can still use activated abilities on permanents you control, or abilities that work outside of the battlefield, and can attack or block with creatures. This is about the extent of what a player under the effects of Epic is allowed to do, beyond the specific effect of the spell they cast in the first place. If you don't have any permanents on board, or if your opponent removes them, your options get more and more limited until you're left doing very little with your turn. The most common play pattern for someone under the effects of Epic is to resolve their spell's effect in the upkeep, then almost instantly pass through their phases to their opponent's turn. One of the strengths of a magic deck is having a variety of cards that support each other. While decks tend to want to be focused on a specific strategy or game plan, Generally, they also want to be flexible enough to answer potential problems from your opponent. Oftentimes, a magic card is played less for its raw power level, but for how versatile it can be in various situations for various types of matchups. Epic, however, forces the player to forego all options not presented directly on the Epic card itself. 
This leaves a player with the deck focused solely on this epic spell, with pretty much every other card in the deck becoming meaningless after the epic spell is played. For example, Undying Flames deals damage based on the mana value of your other cards. This encourages you to build a deck with high mana cost spells. However, that just means that the turns you're waiting to cast this 6 mana epic spell are spent with a handful of cards you cannot cast, and most of the other epic spells don't even care about the cards in your deck. Generally, the most effective way of building around an epic card is to ramp your mana and or search your deck for the epic spell to play it as fast as possible. After all, when most of your cards stop working after you play your deck's key spell, it's hard to rely on those cards much, if at all. You also tend to want permanents that will protect you from your opponent, or at the very least, slow them down long enough for you to get things going. This would maybe be passable if the epic spells had especially strong effects. However, a card like Endless Swarm isn't even all that strong. Given Magic's maximum hand size limit of 7, Unless you used a card like Reliquary Tower, your maximum output every turn would be 7 1 1 snake tokens. Compare this to a card like Avenger of Zendikar, which can often provide more tokens than Endless Swarm when it enters a battlefield, as well as a way to make those tokens more threatening by giving all your creatures plus 1 plus 1 counters. All of this while also not preventing you from casting other spells in response to your opponent interacting with you. With all that in mind, it's not hard to see that the epic spells fall flat in comparison. You have no way of making these snake tokens any stronger so all you can do is hope that you eventually make enough snakes to overwhelm your opponent. This, of course, requires your tiny snakes to survive alongside you, which is easier said than done. And some epic spells aren't even so lucky as to be self-sufficient like that. The blue epic spell, Eternal Dominion, takes a permanent of your choice from your opponent's deck and places it onto the battlefield under your control. This could be a potent effect, the card Bribery is an old school stable card that still shows up in Commander's games. However, it requires an opponent to have a deck full of permanents worth stealing, which is not always a guarantee and especially not in competitive formats. Even if your opponent's deck is permanent focus, there's no guarantee your opponent's cards will even work for you without the synergies of their original deck. Neverending Torment also searches your opponent's deck, but instead exile cards equal to the number of cards you have in your hand. On paper, this may sound better, as some combo decks might not be able to do their combo if you exile the right cards. However, all you've done is remove their primary win condition, and are doing nothing that actually advances your own game. You're essentially hoping that your opponent can't draw into a way to kill you before they run out of cards in their deck, and that's assuming you're in a matchup where your opponent's deck is weak to this form of interaction. All of this ties back to the idea that Epic limits and removes your options when you need them the most. Effects that are strong on one-off cards are much weaker when it's the only spell you're able to cast. You need to both be able to protect yourself and hope that whatever your win condition is, that it works against your opponent. And even then, there's not much active play involved in this on your end. As one Magic designer put it, Epic as a mechanic essentially turns the player into an AI for the other player to go up against. This tends to not be very fun for the player, since their agency in the game is lost as they go through the motions of whatever their Epic spell dictates. And just like an AI opponent, this means your moves are all telegraph. Your opponent knows what your epic spell was, and if it's one of the spells that searches their deck, your opponent obviously knows their own deck's contents even better than you. You have no ability to bluff because the cards in your hand rarely, if ever, matter anymore. The only creatures your opponent has to fear are the ones already on board, or that are being brought out by the epic spell that they saw coming. Even if the opponent is matched up poorly against your epic spell of choice, all they simply have to do is counter it, and you're suddenly left scrambling for another copy to use. It's not hard to see why Epic was a flop. However, that's not to say it's completely without a competitive history. While most of the time in Magic, white gets the short end of the color pie, the white Epic spell is far and away the most playable of the group. Enduring Ideal is a 7 mana sorcery that searches your library for an enchantment and puts it onto the battlefield on each of your upkeeps. This is the only Epic spell that cares what type of cards are in your deck, not just how expensive they are. It's also the only one that gives the player options, with enchantments existing in all colors with answers for any sort of situation. Generally, the player would use enchantments like Dovescape and Ivory Mask to protect themselves from your opponent before eventually ending the game with a card like Form of Dragon. This deck was mainly playable back in the days of Expanded Format. Expanded was the predecessor to today's modern format. It still had a rotating card pool, but instead went back a few years into the available set to allow for more stable decks that were less prone to rotation. It was during an Expanded Grand Prix in 2008 where Enduring Ideal would see its only major event top where it saw 5th place. Enduring Ideal would always be more of a deck at lower levels, such as regional Pro Tour qualifier events. Even after Expanded was replaced with Modern, the deck survived, existing as a rogue option in Modern and Legacy to this day. Of course, with it only having one major top event ever, and that being over a decade ago, it's hard to say that Enduring Ideal is a very competitive deck. After all, if your opponent has removal for your enchantments before you can establish a proper board, then you're basically already dead. On the flip side, if your opponent doesn't have any answers in their deck, then it's a slow but almost undeniable win for the Enduring Ideal player. Regardless of who's winning the game, the game tends to be essentially over the moment Enduring Ideal is cast. It just becomes a question of if your opponent has an answer or not. With modern support, this strategy has gotten even stronger. Enchantments like Solimity printed years after Enduring Ideal have given it more options into locking the game. 
However, many white enchantment decks that play a similar game plan choose to forego Enduring Ideal and its downside altogether and play a more general enchantment control strategy. With the most playable epic card being mostly ignored in the sorts of deck that would want it the most, it's easy to say the epic has completely fallen by the wayside. Not many people want to play a card that actively tells them to stop casting spells entirely. There has not been a single new spell with epic as an ability since the initial cycle of five in Champions of Kamigawa, and there's no secret as to why. The head designer for Wizards of the Coast has even said that Epic has perhaps the least designed space of any mechanic they've ever printed. It's a difficult task to make a card so powerful a player feels okay with only casting it for the rest of the game. It's even more difficult to make a card like that that's fun to play against. Most effects in the game would be horrible if they were the only spell you were allowed to cast. There's no point in casting a card even as powerful as Ancestral Recall if you're not allowed to use the cards in your hand. If an Epic spell is too weak, nobody will ever dare build their entire deck around it. If an epic spell is too powerful, it simply makes for games where the epic player wins the same way every time, or loses because your opponent had the exact answer needed, and there's nothing left for the epic player to do. As such, Wizards of the Coast opted to shell of the epic spells and have expressed no desire to ever return to them. However, that's not to say the design philosophy behind epic spells was entirely abandoned. The original Kamigawa block was themed specifically around the idea of legendary cards. While the epic spells were not legendary in terms of their actual card type, the design goal behind the mechanic was to create non-permanent spells that felt legendary. This was the first time Magic had really considered the legendary rule as anything other than a drawback or a flavorful word. They intended to make the spells flashy and powerful, but also fair. Coverage from Wizards during Champions of Kamigawa spoiler season remarked on how many of the negative points already mentioned as things they aimed to avoid. Wizards at the time were aware they needed to make these cards powerful, yet interactive, able to win the game, yet not overpowering. However, like many things in the Kamigawa block, these ideas, although built on solid ground, were not built up in a cohesive way. After all, despite being meant to feel legendary, they didn't even give the epic spells a legendary typing, meaning that it lacked help from even the support from the limited environment that cared about legendary cards. This brings us to the set Dominaria from 2018. Dominaria was also a set themed specifically around legendary cards, and brought with it its own form of legendary non-permanence. This time around, they were actually legendary, with six sorceries each having the super type in the set. This was unprecedented, although the groundworks were laid by the epic spells all those years ago. At surface level, they share many similarities to their predecessors. Like the epic spells, they are fairly expensive sorceries that have a drawback to make up for their effects. However, these legendary sorceries, like Karn's Temporal Sundering, only require you to already have a legendary permanent on the field to be allowed to cast the spell. The downside is far more manageable, requiring some manner of focus and deck building consideration without completely shutting you off from removing options. While none of these spells have seen competitive tournament play since their printing, they at least show a modernization of designs and ideas present in epic spells. And unlike epic spells, the design space of legendary sorceries is enough that they could go back and add more of them and even support them in the future. And beyond the world of competitive formats, the commander format is already built around having a legendary creature lead your deck, and thus these legendary sorceries become powerful tech options in the format for the right decks. Epic is unarguably one of Magic's least successful mechanics. While initially conceived as a way to bring the flash and flavor of legendary cards to non-permanence, they wound up instead of being a quintet of middling to bad cards that made the game all about them. It simply is too much to ask to only be able to use one spell for the rest of the game, especially when most of the spells are lacking in any actual potent effects. And even when there is a spell with epic that strong, it tends to be more of a gimmicky rogue deck that steals wins off the back of opponents being ill-equipped to face it more than it does its own game plan. Epic was such a failure of a mechanic that not only will it likely never come back, but new mechanics and ideas have been created in the years since then to try and fill the same niche it was angled to take. As it turns out, when people are playing a card game, one of the last things they'll want to do is play something that tells them to stop playing other cards. Throughout all of Magic, there have been tons of powerful mechanics, but few have been as instantly problematic as Dredge. The ability was printed once and only revisited on a single card, whereas other problematic mechanics have at least been revisited at some other point in the future. Despite such a short print run, Dredge has been a game-defining mechanic in multiple formats for years, and Wizards has previously said they regret making the mechanic. Today, we're going to go over exactly why this mechanic is so broken, and why Wizards hasn't really ever tried to fix it. To start off, let's go over what the mechanic actually does. Dredge is a keyword that always comes with a singular number. How it works is that whenever you would draw a card, if you have a Dredge card in your graveyard, you can instead return the card from your graveyard to your hand and mill that many cards from the top of your deck. This mechanic was first introduced in Ravnica City of Guilds all the way back in 2005, and was only brought back for a single card, namely Shenanigans, in Modern Horizons in 2019. The absolute highest number on any dredge card is on Golgari Grave Troll, which has dredge 6. This is a 0-0 for 4 and 1 green that enters the field with plus 1 plus 1 counters on it for each creature in your graveyard, 
and you can pay one and remove a plus one plus one counter from it to regenerate the Grave Troll. For anyone unaware, regenerate means the next time a creature would die this turn, you can instead tap it, remove all damage from it, and remove it from combat. This is powerful enough that the card has been banned in Modern for quite some time. Outside of Grave Troll, the highest dredge is on Stinkweed Imp with Dredge 5. This is a 1-2 with a mana cost of 2 and 2 black. It has flying, meaning it can't be blocked except by flying creatures, and whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, you destroy it. This is basically a weird version of Death Touch. This alone is a pretty weak effect, as is a simple Death Touch threat for 3 mana is far too slow to ever be worth casting. Despite how bad of a body Imp is, it's still the second most heavily played dredge card besides the often banned Golgari Grave Troll, and that's all just because it has dredge 5. This is a great segue into the greater problems with dredge in general. Simply having dredge itself is good enough to make otherwise unplayable cards worth playing, which is quite strange. Why is dredge so strong exactly? Let's start off by going over how dredge was supposed to work from a design perspective. Dredge was mostly intended to be sort of a toolbox deck. Dredge was a very self-synergistic mechanic. If you dredge back a Golgari Thug, you'd put even more cards into your grave like Life from the Loam to dredge back later, which would put even more cards into your graveyard to continue dredging more and more. This would quickly give you access to any of the cards you want in your deck as long as they had dredge. However, this also presented a bit of a problem. If dredge cards were good enough to be played without dredge, they'd be broken if they did have the mechanic you'd be able to repeatedly choose whatever the best card was to draw at any moment. If you wanted a threat, you could dredge that back. If you needed removal, you could dredge that back. On top of all of that, it also meant you would never draw a dead card. Anyone who's played a game of Magic has lost due to top deck in a land when they really needed to top deck some action. And this kind of variance is sort of built into the game on purpose. However, since you can just dredge a card back every turn, you'll never draw dead. This level of consistency would have been a huge issue if all the dredge cards were on rate, so they had to make them a little less efficient. Instead of normal threats, they got cards like Grave Troll, which required a lot of creatures in your graveyard to be good, and therefore only really worked in the late game. For removal, they only got cards like Dark Blast, which only gives a creature minus one minus one until end of turn, only allowing it to kill a very small number of creatures. This caused another issue, however. The dredge cards themselves often weren't worth actually casting. The cards weren't strong enough on their own, so they had to be propped up with other cards. While this alone isn't an issue, it quickly became clear that all of the dredge cards were better off being discarded and dredged over and over rather than actually being cast. This has led to the main way that dredge has actually been played. As a deck that just mills itself as much as possible and plays out of the graveyard. There are a surprisingly high number of creatures that can bring themselves back from the graveyard for basically no mana. The first notable one was Ikorid printed all the way back in Torment. This is a 3-1 that dies at the end of each turn, but can come back for paying no mana by exiling a black creature from your graveyard during your upkeep. By simply dredging a ton of cards, you can get several cords into play every turn, which if done fast enough can be enough damage to end the game. Wizards has, over time, printed more and more cards that like to be in the graveyard, and more and more of them have been powerful in dredge decks. Cards like Prize Amalgam, Narcomoeba, and Bloodgast have all been used alongside Dredge to put a ton of damage on board. The deck's main strategy is to use cards like Faithless Looting and Carthotic Reunion to discard Dredge cards and then draw them, milling a ton of cards. From that point on, they would dredge a card every single turn to mill even more cards, eventually overwhelming their opponent with threats. Now, while this may sound like a novel strategy, it quickly created a number of problems in the competitive scene. The issue was that dealing with dredge in this incarnation was almost impossible. Board wipes may kill your board, but all of those creatures can probably just come right back. Discard spells will most likely just put all your dredge cards right back where you want them, into your graveyard. Counter spells will only stop a dredge spell from resolving for a single turn, and that's assuming that they even cast them in the first place. This is all to say that the only real type of interaction that works against the deck is graveyard hate. While this can help a lot against the deck, they aren't the type of thing most people will want to mainboard. When drawing a card like Leyline of the Void against a deck that isn't that focused on the graveyard is actively bad, as it's mostly just a dead card. So players have to play these in the sideboard, meaning that the first game is against a powerful deck the player won't be able to interact with meaningfully. Additionally, Dredge can't really play the game against a card like Leyline. If all the cards that would go to the graveyard get exiled instead, their deck just doesn't function, so they have to find an out to these kinds of effects to be able to play the game. This means that the first game of a lot of matches will just kind of automatically go to the dredge player, and then games 2 and 3 will be decided by sideboard cards, which is a largely negative play pattern as well as being difficult to balance. 
Dredge has needed to be hit several times at different points in the game's history in order to stop it from being too dominant. As if the deck has an even okay game 2 and 3, its natural dominance over game 1 makes it very scary to be matched up against. The issue the mechanic has from a competitive perspective is enough to make wizards wary of printing it. But that's not where the issue with this mechanic ends. All of this makes designing dredge cards basically impossible. To see what I mean by this, we should look back at Golgari Grave Troll, one of the most infamous dredge cards in the game. Grave Troll is a potentially powerful card in a simple mid-range deck as a threat that scales with size into the late game and is difficult to remove. However, anyone who's played for a while will tell you that the card could be entirely blank outside of having Dredge 6 and would still likely be banned in Modern. As we said earlier, Dredge cards are often better used simply being discarded and dredged over and over instead of actually being cast in Dredge decks. This leads to the question, how exactly are you supposed to design more Dredge cards? If you make them too good, they'll just be broken outright. If you make them a bit on the weaker side outside of Dredge, people will just ignore what the card actually does and just use them to mill themselves further. This means that there isn't too much design space to squeeze out of the mechanic. Even some of the more interesting Dredge cards, such as Golgari Brownscale, which has Dredge 2 and will gain you 2 life whenever you dredge it, has basically never seen any play. It was better to just use graveyard-based ways of gaining life, like Nod to the Bone, in combination with the Dredge cards with higher Dredge numbers, as opposed to playing the more interesting Dredge cards. As a result, there's basically no way to design more dredge cards. Additionally, dredge decks end up playing in a very all or nothing way. If you build your deck to want cards in your graveyard, when you go to draw a card, dredging will always be better than drawing a random card. Sure, there might be times that drawing a certain card would be better than dredging, but the likelihood you draw one of those cards as opposed to something worse than dredging, such as a useless land, is very low. As a result, you were further incentivized to go all in in putting cards into your graveyard and to play more cards with graveyard synergies. The only dredge card that's really seen play and been cast is Life from the Loam, which is maybe overall the most interesting dredge card in the game. This is a source that lets you pick up to 3 land cards from your graveyard and has a dredge of 3. This card has been used in so many ways over the years in so many decks that it takes far too long to cover in this video. But the two main places it's seen play in is as an engine dredge decks and in lands and legacy. Starting with the latter, Lands is a control deck with a combo finish that uses lands like the Tabernacle of Pendril Vale and Wasteland to control the game before finishing your opponent off with a Dark Depths combo. Importantly, every card in the Dark Depths combo and most of the control pieces the deck played were lands, meaning Life from the Loam could get them back for you. After picking up some lands cast at once, you could dredge it back to put more lands into your graveyard, which you can get back right away then. In this way, the card was basically pure card advantage for the deck, as the card's only real downside, being that it would get you lands, was completely negated by the deck's strategy. The other place the card is seen play in is in various graveyard decks where it can be combined with cycling lands. Lands that let you pay one mana to discard them and then draw another card. By picking up multiple cycling lands with life from the loam, you could cycle one to dredge it right back and then cycle the other two to dredge back more cards, milling a huge number of cards out of nowhere. In fact, this was good enough that combining Life from the Loam with Cycling Lands was, for a relatively brief period of time, strong enough to build a deck around as an endless card advantage engine that your opponent simply couldn't answer. Again, this goes to show how problematic being able to dredge back the same card whenever you want it is, as there simply isn't any way to stop Life from the Loam from getting those lands back to a player's hand without going into your opponent's graveyard and forcibly exiling it. This does bring up the question, why did Wizards bring the mechanic back at all if it's so inherently flawed? This brings us to Shenanigans, the only card with Dredge printed on it since the initial run in Ravnica. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 and 1 red. It has the effect to destroy target artifact and has Dredge 1. This card is pretty unimpressive, and Dredge 1 is so low that even though the card has a pretty good effect, Dredge decks have largely passed it up in favor of other options for artifact removal such as Ancient Grudge. However, Shenanigans likely has a very particular purpose for being printed as there was a very problematic deck running around in Modern called Lantern Control. This was a deck built around Lantern of Insight, a card that had previously been almost entirely ignored. This is a 1 mana artifact that makes it that both players play with the top card of the library revealed, and you can tap it and sacrifice a lantern to make target players shuffle their library. By itself, the card doesn't really do anything on its own. However, people eventually realized a novel and infuriating way to make use of the card. One of the most powerful lock pieces in Modern is Ensnaring Bridge, an artifact with a mana cost of 3 and the ability where creatures with power greater than the number of cards in your hand can't attack. This card can have a huge impact on the game, but it has a few issues. 
In order to make the card work, you need to have an empty hand. This wouldn't be that big of an issue, but if your opponent ever outs the bridge, you'll have no way to protect yourself. This has made hiding behind an ensnaring bridge alone a losing strategy overall. This is where Lantern of Insight comes in. What the deck would do is play bridge to stop your opponent from ever attacking, and then use Lantern of Insight combined with artifacts like Codex Shredder, which can be tapped to make target player mill a card. This would effectively allow them to control what your opponent draws each turn, at least to some degree. The idea was to simply mill any out your opponent would draw to ensnaring bridge, effectively forcing your opponent to top deck multiple outs in a row to ever have a chance of winning. Often, getting this to happen would quickly become mathematically impossible, as a lantern player would have too many copies of millers and bridge, to the point where the number of outs in your opponent's deck just wasn't high enough to get around both the milling and being able to actually destroy enough copies of bridge to win. Eventually, the lantern control player would simply mill your entire deck and you'd lose the game. This deck was fairly powerful, and worse, it was extremely aggravating. Once the lantern control player got set up, smart players would just scoop and go on to the next game, as there wasn't much you could actually do at that point. The only real way to win was to hope to open good enough that you could kill your opponent before they set up their lock, usually by opening a couple of naturalized effects alongside a good threat. To make this worse, there really wasn't that much the average deck could do to build their deck to beat Lantern Control. If you were playing a combo deck like Storm that could win without getting to combat at all, you might be able to pull something off, but it wasn't a certainty with the amount of hand disruption the deck ran, alongside with being able to mess with your draws. Not to mention the deck having access to cards like Witchbane Orb to stop most combos from being able to kill them. However, if you were a normal mid-range deck that wanted to win through combat, you were effectively out of luck as there just weren't enough ways to get around bridge for you to ever get through. This got bad enough that people had started playing Icefall as a way to out Lantern Control more consistently. For those who don't know, this is a source with the mana cost of 2 and 2 red that destroys target artifact or land and has recover for 2 red. This means that whenever a creature you control is put into the graveyard from the field, you can play the recover cost to return this card from your graveyard to your hand, but if you don't, you exile it. Icefall is, to put it lightly, not a home run of a magic card. The fact that players were so desperate to have a way to beat Lantern Control led Wizards to design Shenanigans as a way to beat the deck. Shenanigans was able to remove all of the most problematic cards the deck played and could be dredged back from your graveyard, so the Lantern player milling it wouldn't hurt your deck at all. In this very specific situation, Dredge's unique combination of traits allowed it to answer one of the most annoying decks in Modern. And in the almost two decades since the mechanic was introduced, this was the first time Wizards had ever thought it was a good idea to bring the Dredge mechanic back. When it comes to trying to fix the dredge mechanic, there's not much to work with. One note is that no dredge card should ever really have a dredge higher than 3. Anything higher than that, and the deck is just better at being used as a mill engine than anything else. Finding any niche for the mechanic to fill is also very difficult, as even shenanigans ended up not really seeing play as one of Lantern Control's best cards, Mox Opal, was banned out from under the deck. Having a mechanic that allows you to return cards from your graveyard to play an infinite number of times is just too difficult to balance. More successful attempts at similar mechanics include things like escape. This mechanic allowed you to cast cards from your graveyard by paying their escape costs, which always included exiling some number of cards from your graveyard. These cards could be played any number of times and were as weak to graveyard interaction that Dredge was, but couldn't be used as a way to mill yourself, obviously, and were far more balanced. There are plenty of powerful escape cards that were actually cast, and they didn't tend to take over the game like powerful dredge spells did. The cost of exiling cards from your graveyard stopped you from casting them every single turn and not doing anything else unlike with dredge. Escape also plays much better with other mechanics than dredge did, as it didn't replace your draws so you could play with other mechanics more easily. All in all, dredge was one of Magic's strangest mechanics. It's broken in one of the strangest ways, as it completely redefines the way you play the game. Dredge decks really do play in a way that no other deck does, to the point that some dredge decks have stopped playing lands altogether. The mechanic is very difficult to design cards for, as the dredge ability is just far more powerful than what the cards themselves did. As a result, dredge is one of the few broken mechanics that Wizards has all but abandoned, never really returning the mechanic to try and make it work with more modern design sensibilities. Life Gain is one of the oldest effects in Magic, appearing all the way in the first set of the game. It's a pretty natural mechanic to add to your game, as most games where players can lose life give them ways to gain life as well. However, Life Gain is pretty infamous in Magic for not being too good. And today, we're going to go over why the mechanic failed. From a new player's perspective, gaining life seems like a really good deal. It's usually costed quite a bit cheaper than dealing damage to your opponent. In Magic, the person who's at lower life total is usually the one losing the game, as they're usually being attacked by a bunch of creatures they can't block. 
So, wouldn't gaining life and having more life than your opponent mean that you're winning? This usually doesn't actually pan out for a large number of reasons. The main issue is card advantage. Card advantage is a term used to refer to how many cards each player has access to at any given time. So if one player has more cards in their hand than their opponent, and neither player has anything besides lands on board, then the player with more cards in their hand has card advantage, because they have more cards to play with. Now, permanents in play are usually counted towards card advantage as well. If one player has a creature on board and their opponent doesn't, and both players have the same number of cards in hand, the player with the creatures has more card advantage. Their opponent either needs to use a card from their hand to remove their opponent's creature, or play a creature themselves to reach parity on board, which means they'll have to use a card and end up one card behind, meaning they'll end up behind on card advantage. The ins and outs of this can be discussed endlessly, but the gist is that anytime one player draws multiple cards or answers multiple other cards while using fewer cards, they end up going ahead in card advantage. And if cards go from the board or a player's hand to the graveyard, exile, or the library without your opponent giving up a card, that player is losing card advantage. We're bringing all this up because playing a life gain card always means you lose card advantage. You use a card from your hand and don't affect any cards on the board. You basically use a whole card just to get some more life. Well then, what's so bad about that? Sure, we lose card advantage, but life is a resource, and getting more of that resource can be useful. And this is technically true, but the life you gain very rarely matters. If you think about the rest of the context around in a situation where gaining life would seem useful, you'll quickly realize you're only delaying the inevitable. The most common scenario where you'll want to gain life is when your opponent has enough creatures to attack you for lethal on your next turn. If your opponent has creatures with a total power of 6 on board, and you have 6 life, gaining life can save you and give you another turn to play. The issue is that while using a life gain card might save you, it won't change your situation. Your opponent will still be close to killing you with combat, and you'll just be down a card for no reason. More likely than not, you'll just die on your opponent's next turn. However, if you had used that card to play a removal spell or a creature of your own, you could prevent enough damage by blocking or killing a creature to survive anyway, except now you either have a blocker or your opponent has fewer creatures meaning you've actually advanced your board state and still survived the turn. You will need to actually dig yourself out of the hole eventually, and the only way to do that is to remove your opponent's board or make yours better. Trying to outheal your opponent's damage isn't usually practical, because they'll be able to just keep adding to the board and doing more and more damage every turn, and eventually you'll run out of life gain cards, or not be able to gain more life than they can deal damage. So, in the most common board states, life gain cards aren't actually good at saving you when compared to other cards. However, there is one very specific matchup where they're actually pretty good. Burn decks. Burn decks try to kill their opponent by casting a bunch of spells like Lava Spike and Lightning Bolt, dealing a full 20 damage to their opponent with their burn spells. Now, this strategy has a similar pitfall to trying to gain life cards. It means you're constantly losing card advantage. Using a full card to do nothing besides changing a player's life total means you're essentially wasting that card. However, burn decks have been much more successful, because the speed at which they can burn their opponent to death is far faster than most decks can win the game or find a way to stop them. And besides, who cares how many cards are left in your opponent's hand if they're dead? However, you may remember me saying that life gain cards are usually priced more aggressively than burn cards. Cards like Chaplain's Blessing can give you 5 life for 1 mana, while the best rate for burning your opponent is usually 3 damage for 1 mana, as seen on cards like Bolt and Lava Spike. This means that if you're casting life gain cards and your opponent is casting burn spells, you'll be able to gain more life than they're dealing damage. Combine this with the fact that you're both losing card advantage at the same time, and the player casting life gain has the advantage. This is so important in the matchup that burn decks often main doored mediocre burn cards like Skullcrack, specifically because it can stop your opponent from gaining life. A well-timed Skullcrack can be the difference between a burn player winning and losing a match against an opponent with life gain cards. This is one of the main ways that life gain cards have seen play over the years, as sideboard options to help stave off burn decks. Burn has always been a pretty competent strategy in formats like Modern, and pops up pretty frequently in standard formats, so life gain effects have seen sideboard play in decks that need to shore up the matchup. Now, going through all of this, it's doubtful whether or not life gain could really be called a failed mechanic. Life gain cards are a bit of a noob trap, but they're still relevant to competitive play. The effect is better described as niche rather than useless. However, the issue is how the mechanic has been treated over the years, especially in the early days of the game. In Magic, there are things called cycles. These are usually groups of five cards that all have something in common and are usually used to communicate what certain color combinations did in a set. For example, the Ascendancies were a cycle of enchantments that all corresponded to one of the cons of the cons of Tarkir. They all cost one mana of each of the cons' colors and did something that synergized with the color combination in the set. For example, a Bazan Ascendancy has the abilities where it puts a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control when it enters the battlefield. And whenever a non-creature token you control dies, you create a 1-1 white spirit creature token. The Abzan had a mechanic 
where they cared about your creatures having plus one plus one counters on them and gave them abilities if they did have a counter. So putting a 1-1 counter on each of your creatures obviously synergized pretty well with this mechanic. Each of the Ascendancies had an ability like this that synergized with the rest of the theme they were part of. Cycles in Magic are used to tell players what to expect from a certain theme, set, or color. They're a really powerful way to communicate these things to players without directly telling them, as not every player will be so plugged into the game. Lots of players will only ever learn about the game from buying packs and reading the cards, so a cycle is a great way to get them up to speed on the mechanics in a set or what the identities of the colors are. This is a technique for communicating ideas to players that the game has been using since the very first set of the game. And these cycles are where we'll be looking to see how wizards messed up handling life gain. In the very first set of magic, there was a cycle of instants called the boon cycle. Each of these were one mana for three of something associated with the color. Going in order, the blue boon was Astral Recall, which has the effect where target player draws three cards. This card is one of the most broken cards of all time, and kind of shows you how far Magic the Gathering has come. The next most powerful card in the cycle was Dark Ritual, which costs a black mana and has the effect to add three black mana. This card has seen tons of play over the years in tons of different combo decks. Quick side note, the effect to add mana isn't considered a part of black's color pie anymore, but we are digressing here. The third most powerful is Lightning Bolt, which is maybe the most balanced of the cycle. This costs one red and deals three damage to any target. This card is a staple that has seen tons of play in just about every format it's ever been legal in. The fourth best was Giant Growth, which costs a green mana and gives a target creature plus three plus three. This is a fine combat trick and has seen a decent amount of play over the years, but combat tricks are always limited in their use for a number of reasons. The final and by far worst member of the boon cycle was Healing Salve. This costs a white mana and has the effect where you can either gain three life or prevent the next three damage that would be dealt by any target. This card has never been good, even at the very start of the game. For a second example, let's look at the Reflection Cycle. This is a cycle of enchantments that each doubled something. The blue member of the cycle was Thought Reflection, which cost four and three blue and had the effect to double your card draw. The black one was Wound Reflection, which cost five and one black and the ability where at the end of each turn, each opponent loses life equal to the amount of life they lost that turn. Next is Rage Reflection, that costs four and two red and gives all of your creatures double strike, which allows creatures to deal combat damage for other creatures and then hit again during the normal damage step letting them hit for double damage. The green member of the cycle is Mana Reflection, which costs four and two green, and has the ability where whenever you tap a land for mana, you add an additional mana of that color. So alongside doubling the damage you deal to your opponents, doubling the cards you draw, doubling your combat damage versus creatures, and doubling your mana, what affected wizards think was worth doubling for white's member of the cycle? Why, gaining life, of course. And of course, this is easily the worst member of the cycle as every other card just had way more of an impact on the game if you played it. So why is gaining life being placed alongside all these other, better effects, and being the worst member of the cycle such a problem? Well, because it communicates the idea that gaining life is supposed to be as powerful as these other effects. Even worse, it also gives you the idea that gaining life is a unique effect that you could get for played white. This created a really big problem for magic. White's identity as a color is pretty tied to gaining life at this point, and trying to change it isn't really an option. So, one of the five colors of magic has its identity pretty heavily tied to the mechanic that everyone, including wizards, knows that is inherently fairly weak. This is a big part of why white has such a bad reputation within the community. White is usually considered the weakest color in the game, at least in eternal formats like Legacy and especially Commander. People constantly joke about how white is the weak link. The problem has existed for a long time, but it didn't start out that way. At the conception of the game, ideas like card advantage weren't widely understood. Gaining life was initially thought of as an effect that rivaled these other effects, even by the designers of magic itself. For a good example of this, let's look at the card Necropotence. This is an enchantment with a mana cost of 3 black and the abilities where you skip your draw step, whenever you discard a card you exile it, and you can pay 1 life to exile the top card of your library face down, and then put that card into your hand at the beginning of your next end step. This card was actually pretty panned at the time, with lots of players expecting the card to be pretty weak. After all, it has such huge downsides, and who would want to pay life to draw cards? As it turned out, this was one of the most powerful cards not only in the set it was released in, but possibly in the entire game. This amount of card advantage is pretty much impossible to overcome, and being able to draw this many cards would usually put you in a winning position during your next turn. Necropotence decks were easily the best decks in the game, and Necropotence is still banned in Legacy and restricted to one in Vintage to this day. This is usually remembered as a moment when the Magic community learned a very important lesson. The only life point that matters is the last one. Even wizards themselves vastly underestimated the power of paying one life to draw a card. Since then, players have largely started to play fast and loose with their life totals, and life gain cards have largely been regarded as useless outside of pretty specific contexts. 
So it kind of makes sense that Wizards would accidentally put more stock in life gain as a mechanic than it deserved. Considering that they didn't realize how a card like Necropotence would have broken the game in half, it's not surprising that they originally thought a card like Healing Self would be as good as something like Ancestral Recall. It wasn't until the game had been out for a while that they started to realize how bad life gain was as an effect. Since then, Wizards has been working on ways to make life gain decks viable and more exciting. They found two ways to make life gain a better mechanic that people were excited to play. The first is by making it so that life gain isn't the only effect of a card, and the second is by introducing life gain synergies. Starting with the first method, how did Wizards make life gain cards better? Well, they've basically started stapling better effects onto life gain cards, while making gaining life still their main purpose. A great example of this is Revitalize. This is an instant with a mana cost of 1 and 1 white, with the effect where you gain 3 life and draw a card. This card is basically just a healing salve that draws you a card, and that was enough to make you go from garbage to a decent card that decks would play in standard. There are lots of turns where your opponent will deal about 3 damage to you in combat, so playing a card like Revitalize will basically undo their combat stat without making you give up a card, which can allow you to draw something like a removal spell, or even better, a board wipe to get you back in the game. Rather than simply delaying the inevitable, these cards can often give you another turn to spend your mana and make a play that gets you back into the game. Another source of incidental life gain that Wizards has introduced is the lifelink keyword. This is a keyword that means that whenever the card lifelink, usually a creature, deals damage, you gain that much life. This keyword is a really nice source of life gain that often slots really nicely into a whole bunch of different decks. This is usually attached to creatures, which means you can simultaneously develop your board while also finding a way to gain extra life. On top of that, lots of cards that just so happen to gain you life have seen play over the years. For example, Scavenging Ooze is a 2-2 creature that costs 2 mana, and has the ability where you can pay 1 green to exile a card from a graveyard, and if it's a creature card, you gain 1 life and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. Ooze is a card that's mostly played to be a good creature that can get bigger over time, and can mess with your opponent's graveyard. But gaining life was a nice upside to have alongside those other, more prominent card effects. Besides finding ways to give decks more incidental sources of life gain, Wizard has tried to make life gain more exciting by printing more life gain synergies. There are tons of cards like Dawn of Hope, which allows you to pay 2 any time you gain life to draw a card. Or cards like Voice of the Blessed, a 2 mana creature that gives you plus 1 plus 1 counter any time you gain life, and gains even more abilities as it gets more and more plus 1 plus 1 counters. This is only a couple of examples of the tons of cards that specifically give you payoffs for gaining more life. Another way that people have made life gain more useful is by using infinite life gain combos. For example, if you have a Spike Feeder, which has the ability where you can remove a plus 1 plus 1 counter from it to gain 2 life, and a card like Archangel of Thune, which has the ability where whenever you gain life, you put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control, you can remove a counter from Feeder to gain 2 life. This will trigger Archangel, which will put a counter back on Feeder, which will let you remove another counter from Feeder and repeat this process all over again. From there, you can simply loop this interaction over and over until you have what judges call an arbitrary large amount of life. What this means is that you can't actually perform an action an infinite number of times in Magic's rule systems, you can only perform a finite number of times that you choose, meaning you just name a number like a million and gain a large enough amount of life that your opponent will never be able to kill you. Once you gain this much life, you often win the game by default, as your opponent won't ever be able to actually win the game, so you have as much time as you want to either find a way to win, or you can just wait until your opponent decks themselves out as long as they have less cards in the library than you do. Now, it's worth noting that your opponent can actually do infinite damage back to you with some sort of combo. They can get around your infinite life gain. Because you can only perform an action an arbitrary large number of times, whoever goes infinite second can just choose the bigger number. So if your opponent gains infinite life and you do infinite damage, you'll still kill them. But if you try to deal infinite damage to your opponent with a combo, and they gain infinite life in response, they'll survive by just naming a bigger number than you did. So Wizards has found ways to make these cards more playable, but the fundamental problem hasn't really changed. All these life gain synergy cards could care about just pretty much anything, like having creatures enter the battlefield or playing land. And in fact, there are decks built around these mechanics, and they're often better than decks built around gaining life. One of the most successful decks built around gaining life was Soul Sisters, which was built around the card Soul Warden and Soul's Attendant, which each have the ability where whenever another creature enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life. So one of the best ways to make these life gain synergies was to use a card that made a different, easier condition, like having a creature enter the battlefield, cause you to gain life, and then build life gain synergies from there. The only pure life gain card that Dex played was Martyr of Sands, which could gain you three life for each white card in your hand, which was used only to put you over 30 life, so your Sarah Ascendant would get its buff. Outside of this specific interaction, Pure life gain cards were pretty much always relegated to being sideboard tech for burn matchups. So, this is where life gain currently sits in Magic. 
It's a mechanic that's often a lot weaker than it may seem, like it should be, based on how much emphasis the color pie puts on it. Wizards has responded by purposefully making life gain cards better, and they have seen competitive success, but that success is still a bit limited.